and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dev Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Can you believe it? Yes. After all these years, Matt and I have buried the hatchet. <laughs> We're back together, baby. It's a reunion show. Ta da! Wow. <laughs> All you needed to say was that magic word, and you finally did. So I'm glad. I won't. I'd, obviously, it's a magic oh, word just between you and I. Yeah, I, I, won't. I, won't, I won't be sharing it in no. case um, somebody tries to use it against us. You whispered it in my ear last night, and mm-hmm. I said, all is forgiven. Yep, and here we are together, we are. sitting closer than we ever have. <laughs> That's right. I'm on Jess's lap. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us this week, a returning guest. He's not just our editor, he's our friend. It's <gasps> AJ. Oh, AJ. Hello. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back. It's so good to once again um, cross the boundary of being a fan and then edit- ed- editing the show. And then ending. it was all, I'll reveal it now, it was all a plan to one day guest on <laughs> Do Go On. Yeah. I said, first, first I'll offer them my services mm-hmm. and then they'll feel too bad to uh, deny me access to the podcast. First, I'll offer my <laughs> services at a price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very Hollywood, isn't it? Going from fan to employee to now, mm. on the record, as Dave said, friend. Yeah. Huge. I think, yes. I think Margot Robbie did that. You all heard that. it. You all heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Margot Robbie did that with Martin Scorsese. Uh, she started go. out as his uh, landscaper. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. As she can do it all. She yeah. really can. AJ, has, have, have those two worked together? <laughs> Martin Scorsese and Margot Robbie. Yeah. Oh, famously, she, she he discovered her in um, The Wolf of Wall Street. Okay, great. Oh, so, well, well, discovered, discovered her. She had been on Neighbours it. discovered yeah, yeah, yeah. her. <laughs> uh, I think Red Grundy might have something to say about that. <laughs> those, these references are getting too Australian yeah, for me. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> these don't, put, these don't uh, cross a, uh, cross the ditch, well, I don't there's, think. There's a lot of Americans listening going, he's not Australian? Um, yeah. They're all, aren't they all English? There's, it, we mm. all sound the same. Yeah, he sounds just like them. <laughs> And we're like, listen to how funny he sounds. <laughs> exactly the same. Um, yeah. AJ, you are you are gracing us with with another report as well, which mm. again, you're doing all of the work this week, mm. and and we love you for that. You're but, one man band. Thank but you so much. Before we get started, Dave, do you want to explain how this show works? Absolutely, I'd love to. So basically, what we do here, and we have for the last eight and a half, something like that, years, we take it in turns to report on a topic often suggested to us by one of the listeners. We go away, do a bit of research, write up a report, and bring it back to the group. And as Jess says, it is AJ's turn. I say turn. He's volunteered to (laughs) give us a report this week. (laughs) It's AJ's turn once every 40 episodes. (laughs) And I I hope he knows this by now because uh, just in case people don't realise, AJ is the editor of the program. And so you've Mm. heard us say this many, many times and you've also listened to lots of episodes before that. We always start with the question, AJ, do you have a question to get us onto the topic? I do. Here is my question. Which famously unadaptable novel boasts over 20 sequels, several comics, dozens of video games, and multiple TV shows and movies. War and Peace. <laughs> that Not was going to be my answer. Okay. Famously unadaptable. Couldn't adapt it. Couldn't mm. adapt Too it. Too big. Could, it couldn't be done. Yeah. Could not um, be done. Uh, what about James Bond? Has that ever been in a movie? <laughs> oh, maybe some indie films. Um, <laughs> I can't see how that would work. Um, AJ, is mm. it Dune? It is Dune. My backup question was going to be, what month was I born in? (laughs) And which all of us from Australia and New Zealand would say June. And that is going to be one of the many, many hard to pronounce words in this report. It's just D-U-N-E. How are you meant to say June? So I guess like, like we... From this part of the world, we we push D U's and T U's together to make like a J sound mm. often with with um tutor. Well that's more of like a CH sound, I guess. But um but I guess it's Dune. Like you've got to really get the Dune. the U Dune. after the D. Dune. 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 Right. Mm. I think there mm. are Americans right now going, Are you telling me that AJ 
is not from Australia like the others. Is AJ from mm. Australia? They might be asking, and to that I'd say, no. No. <laughs> How do we say no? No. No. I can't even, I can't even I do like, their version no. of it. We say no like Dr. Evil. Yeah. That's yeah. how Australians <laughs> say no. This is, this is me impersonating <laughs> Americans impersonating me. <laughs> no. <laughs> is that not it? I thought that's how they did. <laughs> what is it? Can you do it no. again? No. 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 It's no. E-no-R. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's no. smelled on TikTok a lot. Yeah. 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 Whereas Kiwis what? don't say it like that like we do. We say no. Mm. But Kiwis, how do you say no? Uh, it's more like, it's, it's softer. So it's like a, a it's, it takes you on a journey. It's wow. a no. <laughs> no, like that's an exaggerated version. I think I think generally, if people are wanting to pick up on the differences between our accents, you guys like really chew on your vowels, yep. and it's like we don't want anything to do with our yeah, vowels. Yeah, like we want to get through the vowel as quick as possible, <laughs> and be unintelligible to the rest of the world. And you also right. change I sounds for you sounds and stuff like that. Fish becomes sure. fuck, etc. <laughs> Ex- exactly. Six exactly. becomes sucks. There we go. And I'm sure this will come up plenty of times on this report. <laughs> my, my question, AJ, is the author mm. of Dune slash Dune, where were they from and would that give us any... Mm. Like, how would they have they, said it in an interview, for example? They are American, so they would say Dune, which okay. I also don't agree with. No, <laughs> I think Dune. that's going the opposite direction, right? Yeah. It's like now you're not even acknowledging the U. Dune. Like Dan. sand Dune. Mm. Sand dunes. dunes. Sand dunes. Water. water. Sand dunes. Water. Man, I'm from dunes. all these sand dunes. Let's get some oh water. <laughs> oh, so you guys are familiar with the plots of Dune. <laughs> Do they go to Bonnie Dune? Is that a thing? <laughs> oh, Bonnie Dune would be a great... I, I, it's probably not more than just a Twitter meme, <laughs> like maybe a Photoshop yeah. poster for Bonnie Dune, but someone should make it. Uh, there we go. Put Almost definitely already world. have, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how good it is. Dave's yeah. never had an original <laughs> thought. <laughs> <laughs> As if I could. <laughs> oh, my God. That would melt me down. Now, AJ, anyone can suggest a topic at any time that we cover on this podcast if they go to mm-hmm. dogoonpod.com and click suggest a topic. And I've just looked it up here in our hat, and a couple of people have suggested we cover Dune slash Dune. Yay! I'm glad that I fulfilled the prophecy. <laughs> That's right. So I'd like to say thank you for suggesting this to Miles Blakey from North Yorkshire, and also to Pedro Rosario Silva from Portugal. Thank you so nice. much. Before I begin my report, I do want to clarify what exactly I'm going to be talking about uh, you today. Want to because clarify. I do want to do it here on Dune. My, the, the name of my Google Doc is Dune Go On, which was a joke for only me, uh, but now it's the rest of the world as well. <laughs> That's good stuff. That, fe- that feels meme worthy on Twitter as well. Well done. Thank you so much. Um, Dune is one of these franchises that has an endless amount of finicky lore that people have been obsessed with since 30 years before I was even born, right? So to come in here and be like, hey, guys, I'm going to tell you all about the plots of Dune uh, would be (laughs) incredibly foolish of me and I'd lose all my nerd cred and it would also be your longest episode, probably longer than the the Saints one, to be honest. Because there's a lot of lore. In the, There's a lot the of Thank lore. Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of spin-offs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have included more plot stuff than I initially intended, but hopefully not so much that you guys would get inundated with uh, tweets correcting the minutia. The, the point of this report is not the minutia. So right. if I get something wrong, I, ex- I, I wear that. I own that. Yeah. Um, and we should yeah. also say, don't tweet us, tweet at AJ in HD. <laughs> Please do. Um, I think it's important, I guess, to give a taste of what the, this unfilmable story is like and why it's considered unfilmable, right? Um, so there is going to be some fun, very tedious world building, I'll explain to you guys at, at, at some point. But no, this is more about the journey of the novel to the movie because it's an incredibly interesting story in the if you're a filmmaking nerd uh, like I am. <laughs> Love um, that caveat. <laughs> <laughs> and to give myself even more of an excuse, I have haven't actually read the books, so if anyone comes at me, I'll just be like, oh, I don't know. I just follow the 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 IMDb page can updates. I, can I say I got given a copy for Christmas? Mm-hmm. Not the one just gone, the one before. It's been on the shelf. 
I am committing to reading. Actually, depending on how interesting I find what you're about to yeah, say, sure. I might yeah. do it on book cheat. And do you want to come on and I'll tell you about Dune slash June? Mm. The Please. real story, okay? The real story, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my favourite reviews that uh, my podcast, Cult Popsha, ever got uh, said that we're a podcast that is more obsessed with the IMDb trivia page than the movie itself, yeah. uh, which I <laughs> I love that. I think that describes not just my podcast, but me as a person Same. very well. I can't watch a movie without pulling up IMDb and looking at all the trivia I've ruined oh, so yeah. many movies for myself by reading the plot while I'm watching it <laughs> or seeing a spoiler in the in the trivia, but I have to. Yeah. And then I have to exactly. be like, you know where that guy's from? He's also in this other obscure movie you haven't seen. And everyone exactly. watching movies with me is like, you're fun. The worst, yeah. the worst thing to do is you look up, oh, who's that actor? And you look him up mm. and then you find their character in this movie has a slash. And you're like, oh, mm. it's going to be revealed. Yeah, yeah. You're like, He's got a twin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a reveal later. Yep. And I've ruined it. Yep. Or I they're to only in four of ten episodes. Yes. And it's like, well, what happens to mm-hmm. them? Yep. Um, my, my flatmates and I are very into Survivor at the moment. And you cannot Google a thing about past seasons of Survivor without uh, getting that spoiled. So mm. it's, it's, it's a dangerous world out there. Uh, be careful, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> careful spoilers, everybody. Can I just double check with Dave and Jess? I don't know anything apart from the fact that it's sand related somehow. I don't know anything mm. about these movies or books? No. Nah. Haven't seen- No? Haven't seen Haven't seen either. or read anything? No. Nah. Mm-hmm. No. Have, cool. have, have, have honestly, very movies. little interest. So, Actually, good luck, AJ. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. AJ, I'll stop. Yeah. I'll stop everyone. Yeah. Cards on the table. Yeah. I once tried to watch a 1980s, I believe it was, adaptation of this yeah. movie. Yeah. I got 10 minutes in and I thought, this is the worst film I've ever seen. <laughs> I oh, turned it off. so great. And it was, it remained the worst film I'd ever seen until we started the Phrasing the Bar podcast. <gasps> and now yeah. that film has slipped to third worst film I've ever seen. <laughs> the yeah. worst ones ever Fair by star Brendan Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, so, yeah, the the story of Dune, the unfilmable novel, begins with a man named Frank Herbert. Uh, Frank Herbert began his career as a novelist in the 1950s, uh, having read sci-fi for about 10 years before deciding to write it. Um, I, I found like a list of his, his influences, if anyone uh, wants to know what the guy that made Dune was into. Uh, authors that he followed were uh, Robert. Robert A. Henlon, who made, who wrote uh, Stranger in a Strange Land and Starship Troopers, which are pretty big um, pop cultural uh, tent poles. Um, Jack Vance, who wrote a book called The Dying Earth, and uh, Paul Anderson, who wrote a number of more well known. He wrote uh, Brainwave, There Will Be Time, but he also wrote a novel called What I Can Only Assume Is Pronounced The Servants of Wank. <laughs> um, this was in the 50s. It's spelled W A N K H. So, well, that's all uh, of this, isn't it? it? Yeah, we're all servants of Wang, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you that's nominative determinism. If your first name is Hole, you're born to be a perv, aren't you? It, it's not, it's Pole with a P. Oh, it's Pole it's, Wang. It's, I feel, yeah, Paul Wank. Wait, was his surname like Wank? No, no. The, no, the, book the, the book's called- Okay. The book's Wank. I the book's Wank. was Paul. <laughs> I think Paul even more so, yeah, Dave. Yeah, Paul's still pretty horny. <laughs> Every hole needs a Paul. It what? might be pronounced no. Paul, but it's spelled P-O-U-L, so I don't know. I, again, very P-O-U-L. hard to pronounce words. In what, this. are you going to mention probably, I assume, his biggest influence, George Lucas? Uh, no, George Lucas <laughs> was not born till a long time after Frank Herbert, I believe. Um, That's how he is. Off the nerds. <laughs> <laughs> there is also he also lists H.G. Wells' previous do go on heavyweights. Um, you did a report on War of the Worlds, which H.G. Wells wrote, so not mm-hmm. a report on H.G. Wells himself, but and he was also a, a, big- a Herbert. There you go. And wow, a Herbert. <laughs> oh, it's true. Can't defame the dead. It's true. Can't defame the dead. <laughs> There's just assuming he's dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Uh, Frank Herbert began writing Dune in 1959, apparently after doing uh, way more research than was needed for a magazine article about sand dunes that he never published. So he was <laughs> writing for some reason. He got commissioned to write about sand dunes, did a bunch of research, and then thought, I'm going to make a groundbreaking sci-fi epic about this instead of this magazine article. Um, it is also widely believed that he was very into psilocybin, which is the naturally occurring psychedelic compound found in magic mushrooms. Very important if you know anything about Dune, which you guys don't. So <laughs> get ready for a trip. <laughs> oh, is the whole, is, does the song wake up at the end and they were just having a magic mushroom trip? Is that the- uh, not, not literally, but metaphysically, that's not too far away from what how weird Dune gets. Remember, this is unfilmable. So it's very, it's very, it's not very movie friendly. The 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 initial the original texts, I guess. Um, so in Dreamer of Dune, which is a biography written about Frank Herbert, uh, written by his son Brian Herbert, we're told that Frank was passionate about culinary mushrooms, but doesn't elaborate uh, any further. Uh, than this so he, he we know for sure he liked mushrooms right um, do with and that you know information what you will you know someone's very creative when they name their son brian <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then all their son brian has to say about them is he liked mushrooms mm, yeah I'm, that's the whole biography is, is just he liked my mushrooms. daddy liked mushrooms <laughs> by brian brian's a beautiful um, name for a boy or girl. Boy or girl. Oh, absolutely I beautiful, think- but you just wouldn't see it in a sci-fi novel. You'd, you'd, you'd expe- oh. expect like Xenu 129 or something like that. You know I am I mean? so glad you've set this up, Dave, because there are some boring-ass names in the Dune really? universe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the, before it was published as a novel, Dune was split into parts and released across eight issues of a sci-fi magazine called Analog, which started in 1930 and is still running today, which is... Uh, pretty interesting that this this legacy still exists um when they tried to turn it into like a hardback novel it was rejected by nearly 20 publishers initially uh with one editor beginning their rejection letter with the sentence i might be making the mistake of the decade but <laughs> oh <laughs> they <laughs> sort of knew wow mm. Mm. I, exactly. they probably they i reckon they soften every rejection by starting this <laughs> the letter with that <laughs> Hey, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, every time I've been rejected, it's been like, it's been, uh, this is probably the mistake of the decade, but no. Every time I've been rejected, the other person's gone, you, <laughs> so, you know, we all have different experiences. Yeah, you give someone mm. the vomit of the decade. <laughs> the vomit of the decade. Yeah. At least I'm memorable. Uh, <laughs> the the reasons for these rejections were pretty understandable. This book was dense. It was complex. It was 896 pages of world building, confronting politics, and relentlessly overwhelming jargon, uh, some of which we'll get to later. Um, but those who got it, got it. And Dune was eventually published by Chilton Book Company, which is a publisher that mainly produced auto repair manuals. So we're That's talking awesome. about like underground, underground, like it's a success story now for, for multiple people involved because um, even though Herbert was given an initial advance of seven and a half thousand dollars, but Dune would go on to sell 20 million copies worldwide, making it the highest grossing science fiction novel of all time. Wow. wow. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Yeah. And yeah. I'm only just learning it was a book. Me too. Like moments ago. <laughs> Same. This is part of it. This is genuine. The fact that it's so influential but so mm. underground, a massive part of like why, the the why of Dune, I mm. guess. Or the only thing I know about it is that it, uh, what's the Dune writer's name? Frank Herbert. All I know about it is that Frank Herbert- uh, the day he saw Empire Strikes Back, he said, I've got an idea. <laughs> I've got an idea. That's all, that's all I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the novel's success was slow at first, but by the 1970s, Herbert was able to go full-time as an author, and by his death in 1986, he had published several more novels, including six sequels to Dune, which are called Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, God Emperor of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune. These came out between 1969 and 1985. 
Um, he did plan on writing a seventh novel to conclude the series, but then he died. And after his death, uh, the series very much did not conclude uh, with his aforementioned son, Brian, and sci-fi author Kevin J. Anderson picking up the franchise about a decade later and would eventually dwarf Frank's output, writing dozens of ancillary novels and short story anthologies, the most recent of which, which is called Dune, the Heir of Caladan, was released in 2020. 22. So they are very much still going. This is wow. a, a very long series. And was it, you said that the amount sold, was that just that initial book or you're talking about the whole series? The, I think the initial novel since 1965 has, has sold 20 million copies. Wow. wow. Well, that's wild. Right, Matt, were you thinking that, that there'd been 20 million sequels and that all sold one copy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, I was just wondering if AJ was, you know, Playing us Ballooning the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Pad- padding the stats. Yeah. <laughs> so that means As- if, if every if every um edition of the book that's been sold was to sit on a, a seat at the MCG, Dave, how many MCGs would <laughs> those sales fill? Oh, about two two hundred, is it? Two hundred. Two hundred MCGs. Two thousand right? wow. exchanged. Look He's at him doing maths. Mind. Look at the cogs turning in that little brain. Sorry. Big wow, brain. I've only ever heard it on the podcast. I've never seen it in yeah, real life. Yeah, it's beautiful, before. isn't it? What an honour to be here seeing Dave do maths. <laughs> Let's hope Matt has a regret face at some time today. And then yes! You've got the oh, my God. Wait, I've wondered for years what the what the regret face actually looks like. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea when I've done it. I don't, mm. I, it you can feel it, though. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel regret, but it doesn't always translate to the face. I think Dave's I want everyone to, to know listening at <laughs> home right that Dave, Dave is still doing that. Yeah, well, right yeah, the, it's still doing that. That's right the first time, okay? But AJ, right. you'll edit it together to make it look like Dave's real quick. That's what we're used I'm, to do. A mastermind, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm actually so stoked that we can, yeah, just in real time tell you, AJ, cut that. Cut that out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, so, what is the deal with the novel? What is Dune actually about? And how much of the following plot details will I get completely wrong? And you told it on Twitter. Yeah, exactly. I, I would I would relish more people coming to my Twitter accounts, to be honest. It's, it's very uh, desolate over there for me. Um, so, as well as I sounds being made into you sounds, you also turn E sounds into A sounds. You relish it? I'm just keeping a tally for Americans if they th- still think we sound the same, which I think he sounds ridiculous. <laughs> he sounds like an idiot. How can you equate me to that? But we, we don't. If, if you were say, to say, do you think you sound silly? I'd say no. <laughs> he just can't do it. He thinks all Australia is a Dr. Evil. I don't know how to, mm. I don't know what to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I know I said I don't want to focus too much on the law, but some of the stuff is so batshit and so just fun to to kind of like I want to see what your guys' reactions are to some of this <laughs> total bullshit, right? Can I um, just before? I've, can I just? Sorry, I will stop being a pain in the ass. I, I'm drinking a coffee, <laughs> but uh, can I just double check with you? Did you say that it sold twenty million copies? <laughs> <Hey! laughs> I love grinding a podcast to a halt because you thought of a good yes and to something good- from 10 minutes ago. <laughs> that's just that's our whole life here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm I'm coming in on delay. Yeah. Sorry, AJ. Yeah. It's sorry, okay, sorry, sorry, everyone, okay. shut up. Everyone, shut up. I've got a joke from 10 minutes ago. Hang on, shut up. I was gonna I was I was gonna jump in, but I thought it's fine. I'll wait. I'm d- I'm- I'll wait till AJ's saying something serious again, then yeah, I'll then stop I'll, him. Yeah. I've stopped a podcast before to be like, hey, I've thought of a better thing to say to what we were talking about. To, uh, to, what, You'll fix that in the edit, won't you, Adrian? Yeah, 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 yeah. A- absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, um, just for anyone who's worried, I've stayed away from any massive plot spoilers. I uh, just sort of cherry-picked a mix between contextually important stuff and the most bizarre and tedious stuff. Cherry popped them um, up. Fucking hell. <laughs> Uh, AJ, do go on. <laughs> Dune is so dense that even a basic plot summary ran me about half a page of this report. Wow. So here we go. 
uh, set over 10,000 years in the future in a universe where mankind has long since colonized hundreds of planets. The Dune franchise largely revolves around the Spice Melange, which is a psychedelic drug produced exclusively <laughs> on the desert plains of the planet Arrakis. And when you consume the Spice Melange, it can give you a longer lifespan, greater vitality, and heightened awareness. Um, spice, as it is colloquially referred to, can also unlock prescience in some humans, which is a form of precognition which makes interstellar travel possible. So because of this, Spice is considered to be the most valuable substance in the universe. Uh, and because of that, uh, it is an extremely sought-after commodity. So Spice is harvested from Arrakis, often at the expense and the subjugation of the Fremen, who are the indigenous people of Arrakis, for whom the Spice has long been part of their cultural practices I and it felt a bit too good to be true. Yeah. Mm, exactly. So... Dune is a story of a capitalist, colon colonialist government stealing a valuable resource from a downtrodden indigenous race because, remember, he who controls the spice controls the universe. <laughs> wow, so this is real. Like, he had to be very creative. He He's taken a scenario that probably has never occurred in reality and, um, and, and put that on the page. That's Absolutely. amazing. What a writer. Well, it was sixty in the in sixty five. So this is like height of Vietnam War. Like America, generally, still aren't very much ready to hear um, <laughs> some of these hard truths or, or look at their their dark soul. But even in the sixties, that's right at the height of like right. looking the other way about the the war that's going on. How know? interesting that the Vietnam War inspired Star Wars, and then Star Wars inspired Dune. It's that's so um, interesting, yeah. right? <laughs> wow. Life is cyclical. <laughs> Um, so one of I'm my favourite things. Does that make you- I'm a lounge. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great name for for the new cat. Spice the, 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 the hat tip is so essential for the joke, Sally. Yes. And it's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Spice Melange. Uh, Spice Melange. <laughs> Spice Melange to you. <laughs> what a fun um, word. <laughs> one of my favourite things about Dune is that because it is set in the year 10,191, humanity is largely unrecognisable culturally, but somehow some very basic boring names have survived, <laughs> including Paul, oh, Duncan, no. and, and Jessica. Yeah. There is a, a main, probably the second main character in Dune is wow. named Jessica. So you made it 10,000 years. That's a great the name for, a, for, yeah, for cool people. Well, it's like, yeah. like it. names come back, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, so it probably exactly. felt retro to their parents and they brought it mm. back because they're great, 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 and Duncan. <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> Duncan. Paul. Paul's evergreen. Paul's always in. Yeah? You think Paul's evergreen even 10,000 years into the future? Oh, yeah. be fine. Paul. I well, think Paul's forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, the main character of Dune is named Paul Atreides. So, the, the main dude, the name Paul you hear- Paul Atreides. Well, we know he probably won't <laughs> arrive on time then. <laughs> or on budget. <laughs> Amazing joke. That's awesome. <laughs> Paul Atreides. Another Twitter meme right there. Someone make that. <laughs> um, Paul is a young noble from the planet Caladan, whose family are assigned by the Galactic Emperor- to to travel to Arrakis and take over spice harvesting from the brutal House Harkonnen, who are the bad guys. So Caladan or House Atreides are the good guys, House Harkonnen are the bad guys, and the Emperor has just said, hey, Harkonnen, you're out, Atreides are in, they're going to be the stewards of the spice from now on, right? <laughs> Stewards of the spice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, to make things um, even more delightfully complicated, uh, Paul is essentially the chosen one for two to three separate 
parties. He is both the heir to the powerful House Atreides and the supposed messiah for the Fremen. Um, His mother, Lady Jessica, is a member of a zealous but sinister spice-based religion called the Bene Gesserit. Now, (laughs) if you need to write these names down, I'll give you some time. Um, Paul uh, Paul was carefully conceived specifically as a crossbreed of spice-sensitive bloodlines and is believed to, by some to be the all-powerful Kwisatz Haderach, uh, mm-hmm. which is a prophesied messiah who can bridge space and time like none before him. Are we this following? is all making sense have, so far. Have yep. we you got any questions? Nah. <laughs> My yeah, eyelid is twitching. <laughs> I think that's the coffee. That's the coffee, though. That's the coffee. It's the spice. It's, you've, yeah. you've, you've, you've consumed some spice. <laughs> melange. Spice <laughs> melange. Praise the bean. Um, melange, the I heard recently, is actually like French for variety. So variety is the spice of life. Apparently, I don't know if that's true. That's one of these those things you hear on the internet and go, that's true. I'm going to tell people that for the next 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kwisatz Haderach is far from the only mind-boggling term that is coined by the Dune books, and it's not even the only word used to mean what it means. The world building in Dune can seem so overwhelming until you realise that a lot of this shit is just different cultures interpretations of the same basic idea. So yes, Paul is believed to possibly be the Kwisatz Haderach by some members of the Bene Gesserit, but he is also referred to as the Lisan al-Gaib, meaning the voice from the outer world. This term is used by Fremen who have specifically been converted by Bene Gesserit missionaries. Not all Fremen, just converted Fremen, right? Um, the, <laughs> generally, Fremen also use the term Mardi to refer to a mythical messianic figure, um, a word which means the one who will lead us to paradise. And on top of these, Paul is also given not one but two new names when he meets the Fremen, Usul, which means the strength at the base of a pillar, and Muad'Dib, which is the uh, name of a small but wise desert mouse that roams Arrakis and a star constellation used by the Fremen to navigate. So, right. so did you say 20 terms. million copies? <laughs> 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 but also 20 rejections, so it makes a lot more sense now, right? Um, all of these terms basically mean space Jesus and throughout June are used often interchangeably to refer to Paul, right? Okay. They'll be like, Mardi, Lisan al Gaib, Usul, etc., etc. Paul, etc. Paul, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, Other fun terms you'll find littered throughout Dune that don't just refer to Paul include Fadaikin, Sardukar, Seach, Stillsuit, Thumper, and of course Shai Halud, which is the Fremen name for the enormous sandworms that tunnel through the deserts of Arrakis. You will see, if you Google Dune, you will see sandworms featured in all of the, or if, if, you know, most of the imagery used for various Dune book covers and posters and artwork. Um, I would say the spice and the sandworms tend to be the two big things the general public uh, often know about Dune right. if they're not that familiar with it. And I, I never knew this is a metal band called Shai Halud and I never knew where that oh, name is from. Oh, there we go, there we go. There you go. I didn't know that. Um, um, nerdy metal band? Well, I never. <laughs> <laughs> so the the two elements, the Shai Hulud and um, the Spice, are actually related in universe because the Spice is a substance produced by sandworms when they are in their larva stage. Now, that sentence isn't technically correct from a law standpoint, but from what I can see, even the biggest Dune fans are like, yeah, that's basically it. The, the, the spice comes from the worms, sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a simplified way of saying a needlessly complicated uh, piece of fictional law. <laughs> Any questions about the Dune law so far so that far, I so probably good. can't answer? Space yeah. Jesus, special spice from worms, got it. Exactly, okay. has exactly. It, has, you would know this. Has there ever been a Dune Barbie? No. Unfortunately, well, not yet, but both properties are very in vogue right now, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of um, crossover in, in some form. Like a, some some sort of Barbie any toy worm? manufacturer own the, the rights to Dune? Well, what a deep cut question. I have no idea. Probably, right? You'd, you'd think so. I, I would imagine Mattel, so. Oof. 
And it'd be this- easy. So when when you consume a lot of spice, your eyes turn like this brilliant shade of blue. So it'd be very easy to just get a Barbie and make her eyes super blue, and then you go, there you go. It's a it's a sit on a big worm. <laughs> Lisan Al Gaib Barbie, sit her on a worm. A, comes the worm sold separately though. <laughs> worm sold separately. <laughs> so the the desire to develop the Dune novel into a film dates back to the seventies, before Frank Herbert had even written half of the books. Uh, but as you can probably guess, based on all that bullshit I just told you, this is not a very adaptable story. This is not something that makes a lot of sense for a average runtime for for your your standard movies, especially at the time. Um, and it was also like it's very spectacular, which in the sixties there was a lot less. Like it's not like today in the digital effects age, right? Where where anything's possible. This was like two thousand one. A Space Odyssey was the craziest thing anyone had ever seen at this point in time. But and it had still to is till, uh, today. To be George fair. Lucas and Star Wars changed the game in exactly. two ways. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, June's expansive story and inaccessible screeds of made-up history can read less like a novel and more like an encyclopedia at times, which is maybe why, despite being relatively niche and underground until recently, June is considered to be maybe the most influential piece of sci-fi ever written with countless other works incorporating indirectly referencing or blatantly ripping off the franchise's ideas and bespoke glossary over the last 59 years instead of adapting the source material right so uh, you'll see sci-fi concepts eerily similar to those featured in Dune show up in everything from Studio Ghibli to Mad Max to Spongebob Squarepants and of course Star Wars which did actually you might not know this came out after the June book was written. Did you guys know? Wow. That? Isn't that a, that's one of the trippiest things about it. I yeah. feel like I'm having melange right now. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I am tripping balls. How does that how's that possible? How can you inspire something that came from before you? Someone called the Lasan Al Gaib because I'm tripping out on spice right now. Yeah. Your eyes are a vivid blue. Mm. But that's just mm. always He sounds a bit like the guy who Liam Neeson was in Batman. Is that a similar uh, name? Ra- Raz Al Ghul. Yeah, totally. Okay, quite different, actually. Oh, Don't there's worry an about Al it. in the middle of it. Okay. <laughs> I am still with me. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Anything to not be completely wrong. <laughs> um, Star Wars owes its entire existence to Dune and is probably the reason Dune seemed so obscure for so long because Star Wars usurped it as being the definitive piece of sci-fi pop culture and a much more accessible medium and a streamlined story about a spiritually gifted young man battling an evil galactic emperor, right? So... They made it a lot easier. Like, like Dune is full of moral greys and stuff, whereas Star Wars is quite famously, there's good and there's evil and there's nothing really in between, which, again, is probably not true for those of you that really love Star Wars, but uh, <laughs> that's what it looks like if you only watch the movies. <laughs> Even if it was intended that way, though, it, it's not really, is it? Because the isn't it? It's all about balance. It's like the, isn't the whole thing about you need half evil and half good. Mm, so that's very, very true. Which from- makes it quite grey in itself, really, doesn't it? That you need, you're like the system mm. needs half evil. Whew, wow, what kind of system Let's- is this, George? <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe George didn't survive. Yeah, but George Jessica is in did. the world of Paul and Jessica mm. and Duncan. Mm. Duncan's in its own league. I was going to say, yeah, Duncan deserves to. You want to know the character's surname? Yes, is Idaho. Duncan Idaho <laughs> is Get the name of the character. Absolutely. Fucked. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. rules. Yeah. <laughs> Spot played by Jason Momoa in the new movies. Oh, that's so good. Okay, so currently in our Do Go On group chat, my nickname is Daddy. And I never wanted to change that because I think it's very funny that the boys type in Daddy to talk to me. But <laughs> I'm tempted to change it to Duncan Idaho. Duncan <laughs> Idaho like is so funny. That rules. You're not tempted to change it to Lady Jessica, the character who's actually God, in Dune. God, no. How boring. <laughs> Duncan Someone Idaho was- or Daddy. <laughs> Matt, you can be Lady Jessica just for for supreme confusion and the do Thank go you on so group much. chat. I appreciate that, Milan. <laughs> and and Dave, you can be the Quizats Hederak. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that feels right. It's an honour. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so Star Wars also heavily features several desert planets, and there's even a, a a spice in Star Wars that is it's off screen, I think, in movies. But if you read the comics, uh, you'll see that spice is a narcotic that is harvested for its psychedelic benefits. So oh, it's wow. not even different; it's just wow. exactly the same thing. And I haven't gone too much into this, but there is some like bad faith people people interpret it as pretty bad faith on George Lucas's part that like this is not like loving homage as much as it is just blatantly stealing ideas is, is right, but generally how, the attitude how could it be a ripoff if star wars is set you know, a long time ago oh, and yeah, this is set 10,000 years in the future explicitly oh, in the future explain that to me. yeah 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 Cop that, um, AJ. <laughs> I don't, that. I don't, you've got me you've got me <laughs> Which is probably a bit rich coming from us, seeing as you are literally in the past right now in New Zealand. So <laughs> I'm future. in the future, actually. The I'm future. two hours ahead Jeez, of you. Jeez, whoa. Yeah. This it's is 3 what confused PM me. here, baby! <laughs> so you're saying June is... <laughs> so June's, New June's New like New Zealand? Mm, June is and like Star New Wars Zealand. Is like- let's, let's start the report again. June is like <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> now, <laughs> what do I mean by that? <laughs> they talk a little different. <laughs> It's so, so funny to see AJ yelling, it's 3 p.m. here, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully this all gives you guys a sample of why exactly June was considered impossible to adapt. Uh, but this didn't stop Chilean, French, avant-garde filmmaker and fellow AJ, Alejandro Hodorowski, whose surname I'm going to accidentally pronounce Jodorowski probably a hundred times <laughs> um, in this report because I'm an uncultured New Zealander, as we've discussed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so Hodorowski is wild, best known um, for some extremely crazy, weird, breaks all the rules films like uh, El Topo was his first film. And you may you may have heard of this one uh, it's called the holy mountain uh, which is a movie described by director richard stanley as feeling like a work of art that comes from a parallel world it is i i've seen clips of the holy mountain and it looks very strange it's very vibrant colors but everyone's naked in it and running around (laughs) deserts and it's from like the early 70s very very strange film Um, But it was very successful, um, especially in the avant-garde Chilean French uh, (laughs) scene, I guess. Um, And in 1974, after the immense success of The Holy Mountain... Uh, French producer Michel Sidou uh, approached Hodorowski wanting to make a film with him. Sidou asked Hodorowski what he'd want to make, and Hodorowski said, Dune. In the 2013 documentary Hodorowski's Dune, of which I've taken a lot of information from, and it's great, everyone should watch it, it goes into and it, it, far in more detail. In a loving detail. homage kind of way, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it goes into far more detail than I was able to in this 4,000-word um, report. Go check it out if you want to learn more um but yeah in the documentary Hodorowski explains that he hadn't actually read the novel uh but his friend had and said it was fantastic <laughs> um so just like me doing a report on a novel I haven't read um I'm in, in good company with fellow weird AJs um <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Hodorowski then moved to a castle in France and yes. began began to assemble a team of artists and filmmakers to bring an adaptation of the novel to cinemas. Uh, not only had Hodorowski not read Dune, but he doesn't seem to really like how the book was written either. In the documentary, <laughs> um, he describes his experience trying to read it as, uh, quote, you have a hundred pages of literature where you go on to discover with great difficulty what the book is about. The first 100 pages, you understand almost nothing. It is insinuations. So straight from the guy that wanted nothing more than to adapt this book, even he is like, this is not a good book to adapt into into film. Um, Hodorowski goes on to explain the spiritual experience of translating this apparently unreadable book to screen and describes his ambitious Dune film multiple times in the documentary as sacred. You get the impression that he wanted to make a movie which transcends the medium of film, transcends art, something that would become a thing of worship. Very strange guy. 
very strange films. And is this the movie that Dave ranks as the third worst of all time? It, it is not. We'll get to that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, this is the fourth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hodorowski's team soon included artists and designers like Jean Mobius Giraud. Uh, probably pronounced that terribly, just as I have half the other stuff in this report. Uh, Dan O'Bannon and Chris Foss, which I don't have much trouble pronouncing, I guess. <laughs> um, and H.R. Giga, who many uh, probably recognise as a very famous, creepy, surreal artist. A lot of these guys just straight up moved to Paris for the opportunity to work with Hodorowski and bring the film to life. Uh, together, they tirelessly went to work creating dozens of costumes, hundreds of incredibly detailed and beautiful pieces of concept art, and a 3,000-panel storyboard of the film, essentially doing all the cinematography on paper first in basically the form of like a roughly sketched comic book. Um, so... They put in the hard yards because back in those days, I guess they really had to prove that this was possible because it didn't look very possible. The, the film was to start with an unbroken long shot zooming through the universe, uh, blitzing past galaxies and planets, past space pirates stealing spice from transporter ships until finally arriving on Arrakis. And this is all pre-Star Wars in 1974. Star Wars was 77. This is 1974. The only thing close that people have seen is, as I said, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And when they went to the guy that was the like, uh, art director for 2001 A Space Odyssey the best in the business they had an interview with him and Hodorowski went this guy's not for me he's too controlling and, and, and went with um, Dan O'Bannon instead who art directed like a very cheap B movie in the sci-fi genre wow yeah so Hodorowski also had a pretty all-star cast in mind for bringing uh, the film to life. He brought in David Carradine to play Duke Leto Atreides. This is Paul's father. He is played by Oscar Isaac in the new films, if you're um, wanting a sort of uh, modern-day reference. Uh, he also approached Mick Jagger to play Fade Ralpha, or Ratha. Uh, Fade Ratha is played by Austin Butler in Dune Part 2 that came out earlier this year. Um, and he also sought Orson Welles, another um, War of the Worlds heavyweight, um, as the hedonistic Emperor Harkonnen, who is played by Stellan Skarsgård in the new films. Uh, my favourite character. He's this gross, gluttonous blob that bathes in pitch black oil. It's great. Uh, but yeah, he wanted um, Orson Welles and promised to like hire the chef of his favourite restaurant to be on set in order to secure <laughs> Orson Welles for the film. That's great. Oh, Darren from Domino's? That's rules. <laughs> you, got, um, you got Darren budget? <laughs> Whoa. He knows how to put on the meatballs better than anyone in the biz. Anyone. <laughs> um, for the role of Paul Atreides, played of course by Timothy the Charlemagne in the new films. Um, oh, he plays Paul. He plays right. Paul. Um, Hodorowski cast his 12-year-old son, Brontus <laughs> Hodorowski, uh, Brontus. to play- Brontus. yeah, exactly. Uh, oh. Brontus was forced by his father to learn karate and acrobatics, uh, hiring stunt coordinator Jean-Pierre Vinot to teach him not only karate, but jujitsu, judo, aikido, atimi jitsu, <laughs> and sword fighting. Vinot trained Brontus Hodorowski six hours a day, seven days a week for two years to prepare oh for the God. role of Paul Atreides. Brontus, now grown up, describes Vino as having had no mercy. Um, Alejandro Hodorowski justifies putting his son through such a strict regimen by explaining, quote, in that time, if I needed to cut my arms off in order to make that picture, I will do it. It was sacred. You need to sacrifice yourself. I was even ready to die, which gave me I wish I was never born vibe. So I, yeah, I jotted really it good. down. But also yeah. he's saying like I you know, I you know, you, you gotta sac you make sacrifices for the art. I would have cut mm. off my arms. Instead I just tortured my son. I tortured and my son. I, <laughs> yeah, I put my son through something he really didn't want to do for a really yeah. long time with a person yeah. who had no mercy. That's the kind of sacrifice yeah. I, I was, was making. To make. That's right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I sacrificed my relationship with my son. Mm, exactly. We don't speak now. <laughs> I really hope that, that, like, after, like, a few months, the son just beat up his dad because he's like, I'm <laughs> awesome at martial arts. No, you're what? thinking of Star Wars again, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> 
Do you know what? When I started doing, because I did Taekwondo as a teenager, mm-hmm. and my mum had a rule that I was not allowed to practice on my brother. My brother, wow. who was seven years older than me, and was already hitting me <laughs> with no yeah. technique. Mm. That's badass, Jess. Yeah. So I'm not allowed to hit back now that I know how to do it. <laughs> you can defend yourself. Just that, was that a Taekwondo move, Jess? Stop doing that <laughs> one. No, it was my own mixed martial art that I invented. <laughs> it was Jess Kwondo, and it's very cool. <laughs> that Jess, that was a Taekwondo block. Let your brother hit you, please. No blocking. <laughs> Have another go, Matt. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, Brontus and Alejandro are still like Brontus is an actor these days, and and they still have what looks like an all right relationship. So I yeah, don't want to sure. uh, dump on them too much, but it is yeah, questionable. But you, you did just say Brontus is an actor, mate. So mm, I think mm. out in the out in public, he's going, "Oh yeah, no, I love my dad. Yeah. I'm glad he I'm glad he made my childhood fucking miserable." Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry, just jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great stuff. <laughs> Thank you, man. We'll, we'll insert that. We'll insert that. <laughs> um, most notably of all the casting uh, decisions, though, Hodorowski sought out Salvador Dali to play the Galactic Emperor pulling all of the strings. Um, Dali's involvement ballooned the estimated budget for the film because Dali wanted to be the highest paid actor in Hollywood uh, with a rate of $100,000 per hour. Um, they <laughs> <laughs> talked about it and and in the documentary you get the sense that it's not about money it's about it's still kind of about art like Alejandro and Salvador Dali are like yeah yeah we'll it'll be like part of it is you're the highest paid actor <laughs> you know like it's part of the fun for them wow. um, but Dali eventually settled on a counter offer of 100k per minute for the total of the three to five minutes that he would appear in the film um, loving the idea that he would be known as the 100k per minute actor like I he would was take like that. yes that's mm. a good title I'd take, I would take three to yeah. five 100k for mm. three to five minutes of work. I'd take and, that. But, but you'd be playing Duncan Idaho, of course, who's in the films a lot more than the Emperor. <laughs> Duncan Idaho! <laughs> and also you're you're getting paid based on how many minutes you're on in the film, right? So they, the editors could really screw you. Yeah. So yeah. You've been chopped, <laughs> I had that thought too. You shot for five months, but yeah, yeah. we just chopped your character arc out of it. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 You actually um, owe us money for <laughs> Any any extra scenes needed of the Emperor were to be performed by a robot lookalike, and Dali eventually accepted the role on condition that the plastic lookalike was donated to his museum and that his throne room uh, would well that his throne would be a toilet made up of two intersecting dolphins. Those were his sure. final terms, which is very Salvador Dali, from what I understand of <laughs> yeah. the artist. <laughs> Rhinoceros. <laughs> that's my sorry. That's my Dali impersonation. Rhinoceros. <laughs> Uh, part of Hodorowski's vision also involved roping in different bands to compose the scores for the different planets featured in the film. He brought That's in, fun. Yeah, he brought in French prog rock band Magma for, oh, I should have looked up how to pronounce this, Guidi Prime, which is the home planet of House Harkonnen, uh, but but famously also brought in Pink Floyd for Caladan, um, the, which is the home planet of, of House Atreides. The story goes that Hodorowski had a meeting with Pink Floyd while while they were eating hamburgers in between recording sessions, whereupon seeing their disinterest, Hodorowski completely tore into them, explaining that he was offering them the opportunity of a lifetime. The chance to <laughs> score, quote, the most important picture in the history of humanity. We will change the world and you're eating Big Macs. How? And this apparently convinced them to join the team. So they got all of these people are, are officially on on board, by the way, wow. by this point. In my mind, though, like, he was pitching to them and they just hadn't said anything because they were eating. And, <laughs> but he's interpreted that as not interested. And then he just starts yelling at them and they're like, yeah. no, no, we, that was sounding good. Yeah, yeah. no, I was going to do it. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, you, you're really blown at this time, boys. <laughs> I just didn't want to speak with my mouth full. Yeah, I'm polite. <laughs> um, he, just kept, he keeps escalating. If you don't do it, Pink Floyd, my son will bash. 
Yeah, I will, my son will die training for this role, and you're not even going to put down your Big Mac. I'm going to force my son to learn prog rock <laughs> six hours a day. And <laughs> become a play all the instruments. <laughs> six hours a day, Robert Fripp's going to sit him down and make sure he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so, Hodorowski's vision of Dune was, despite its its various dark elements, um, seemingly a lot less cynical than a lot of other interpretations. Uh, Without spoiling anything from the novel or the new films, I would say most commentators read it as like, power corrupts even the the pure you know like like if, as i said it's a very morally gray story and paul's journey of embracing the role of lisan al gaib is at least a cautionary tale right you're not supposed to it's not like luke skywalker where it's like yay he became a jedi this is a lot more um ominous i guess uh but um Jodorowsky departed from this in the novel. Sorry, Hodorowsky departed from this in the novel, uh, seemingly drinking the Kool Aid himself instead. Uh, the film was to end with Paul being killed in battle, but his voice bellowing out of several of the characters in this film saying, I am Paul and you cannot strike me down, uh, before his spirit possessed Arrakis itself, sprouting a lush green paradise out of the desert and blasting the entire planet throughout the universe where the voice of Paul brought salvation salvation to other galaxies this is not in the book this is what Hordorowski thought the ending should be wow paul (laughs) is very powerful Mm. (laughs) so all of this pre-production the dream team assembled and the bible-sized art book wasn't enough to secure the estimated 15 million dollar budget uh, the Hollywood bigwigs described the extravagant pitch as wonderful and superb, but too weird and not relatable to American audiences. And they didn't understand Hodorowski as a filmmaker who was constantly pushing back against the 90 minute runtime requested from studios, insisting the film should take however long it takes, which he estimated would be, get ready for it, 12 to 20 hours long. <laughs> Um, did, did they start the rejection no. letter with, we might be making the mistake <laughs> of the decade? <laughs> I mean, it's true. Re- they do seem regretful. And, like, Hodorowski's not the only person with, like, skin in the game trying to get this made, you know? But it's just, it's too long. It's too big. And, and like, nowadays you'd look at a sentence like that and you'd be like, okay, so make an HBO limited series, right? But I guess yes. TV was looked quite differently at back back then, maybe. But it's so, so funny. He he's the visionary, but he's also clearly because he won't compromise at all. Mm, he's the reason it's not getting made as 100%, well. One hundred percent, absolutely. Yep. So the project was cancelled, and Hodorowski's Dune went down in history as what many consider to be the greatest film never made. Um. So that's it. It's gone. It's go- the all, unfilmable all- books <laughs> greatest film never made. Yeah. Wow. yeah exactly. Um, it is believed that only two copies of this famous art book still exist today, and one of them is owned by Hodorowski himself. Um, it's not all. It's not all for waste though, because imagery from the art book um, is also thought to have been gutted and reused in films which released in the wake of Dune's cancellation, like Star Wars or Flash Gordon or Indiana Jones, and of course Alien, which poached almost all of Hodorowski's entire creative team, most famously H.R. Giger, who designed the phallic pseudo-sexual palette of the Alien aesthetic, Uh. basically. Um, film critic, and here's a fun name for for your collection of fun names in the the Do Go On library, Drew McWeenie. Uh, (laughs) He he says that without Hodorowski's Dune, there is no Alien, so then there is no Blade Runner, and then there is no The Matrix. And can you imagine what the early 2000s would have looked like if The Matrix never came out. It's just not a world I want to live in, AJ. It's not not a world I want to live in. Um, So not only is Dune the novel, probably the most influential sci-fi novel in history, but the failed attempt to adapt it is also incredibly influential. Um, Director Nicholas Winding Refn says in the documentary, what if the first film of that nature had been Dune and not Star Wars? Would the whole Megabucks blockbuster structure have been altered? which is a fascinating thing to think about because it wasn't that far away from being a reality. And I think the world 
or at least my world of <laughs> movies and, and pop culture would look very different if like the one that cracked the blockbuster spectacle was star was june instead of star wars but what if it? What if they made it and it was a huge failure, and meaning that Star Wars and st- any of these yeah. movies never really got a crack, and there was no big budget uh, sci-fi at all? Think I about mean, that, AJ. The, the 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 pretentious film nerd in me would argue maybe that would be a good thing because I would argue Star Wars is output into the world now is kind of ruining uh hollywood a little bit and also um i like star the 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 original star was fine but like before the 70s you've got taxi driver you've got the godfather you know you've got these these intellectual uh very smart movies and then star wars basically made everyone go oh special effects is cooler than moral gray areas let's focus on that instead whereas dune is the middle point between those two i think so maybe we would right. actually have a, a more balanced um blockbuster landscape would you argue that <laughs> there aren't any good movies anymore yeah or, man. Uh, or <laughs> uh, would you put it like this aj would you put it like this they don't make them like they used to. They don't. They truly don't. Um, or in the case of uh, Hodorowsky's Dune, they didn't make them then either. So. <laughs> <laughs> or in the um, case of Star Wars, they're still making yeah, them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hodorowsky has himself reused a lot of the imagery from his ill-fated Dune in his comic. In a comic, I think it might be a series, it's called The Inkle. You look at it and there's a lot of the same ideas um, in there. So... Alejandro Hodorowski, however, is not the only filmmaker to try and tackle a Dune adaptation. And in fact, he's not even the only fucking weird filmmaker to uh, try to do it. Are we at all familiar with the director David Lynch? Do we recognise the name? Do we know his work? Yes. Yes. Mulholland Drive is that Mulholland David Lynch? Drive. Mulholland Drive is, is um, David Lynch. Blue Velvet. Twin Peaks or Twin, Twin Peaks, Pox, as you Tw- would say. Twin Peaks. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. The Elephant Man. The Elephant Man. Great. I'm very impressed to do go on to. I well, did a <laughs> I did a primates episode about a short film he made a few yes, years ago about a monkey or a chimp or something. It's like what happened to Jack or something. Yes, that's, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Are so, you most impressed by my reference, though, AJ? Mulholland Drive is a fantastic film Jess have you seen it I did it in a in a film class in uni and I had to watch it twice or well, multiple times mm-hmm. and while reading along with a, an explainer because I did fun it. awesome yes yeah, super <laughs> fun I loved it is that the one that uh just had a bit tacked on at the end it was meant to be something else or something <laughs> no, it was converted from a TV show to a movie. Yeah, I know yeah. that much. That's but. what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for those unfamiliar, maybe listening, David Lynch is an American surrealist filmmaker. Uh, yeah, Twin Peaks, Mulholland Drive. If you've never seen a David Lynch film, think about the stereotype of the surreal or weird or intentionally off-putting student film that you'll have seen a hundred examples of in your life. Uh, those films are all trying to be Lynchian, whether that they realize it or not he i i see david lynch as like the inventor is a strong word but the 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 guy that like put this brand of weird out into the mainstream basically um so his films are littered with uh, with strong violent religious and sexual imagery and his personal life is no less bizarre the man has been married four times um he's very into transcendental meditation and during the pandemic he would release weather reports on his youtube channel that's all he was doing he would you would, you, you would go on there and be like okay so today this is a really good david lynch impression by the way today it's gonna be cloudy and a high of of 15 and then he'd be like see you tomorrow and that'd be the, <laughs> the weather report i've never heard him speak before i don't think he, i, he I acts, wasn't picturing that he acts in quite a lot of his stuff he's if you've seen twin peaks he plays the deaf police captain in I'm twin peaks up. who's a great i character. Uh, have seen twin peaks but you can't tell you anything about it apart from there's a cafe He's, he goes the guy to drinks the cafe. coffee. Yeah, yeah. There's a yeah, cafe. Yeah. Oh, there's a diner. It's one of the, some of the characters working at a diner. He's Correct. got grey hair. He does yeah, now. He's got a it, shock of grey hair. It used to be pitch black back in the Twin Peaks days, so he went he went oh. hot to cold. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, he he is a weird guy, but perhaps one of the greatest filmmakers 
of all time, right? Um, and in 1981, Hollywood producer Dino De Laurentiis hired Lynch to direct an adaptation of Dune after none other than Ridley Scott dropped out of the project due to, you know everything that stops people from making a Dune movie. Um, Dune would become Lynch's third film, following up his career-making debut, A Race Ahead, and his sophomore hit, The Elephant Man, that Dave mentioned before. Um, Lynch had also never read the novel, but unlike Hordorowski, he did pick up a copy and finish it before agreeing <laughs> to direct. Uh, legend has it that Lynch chose to directing Dune over another space opera blockbuster searching for a director at the time called Revenge of the Jedi, later retitled to Return of the Jedi. Wow. Whoa. Mm. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. How yeah. different would that have become? Yeah. Well, that's what everyone says. But I think it's one of these things that's like over embellished. Like when I've heard Lynch address it, it sounds more like someone asked, hey, what about a Star Wars movie? And he, he says in an interview, he immediately got a headache when he was offered <laughs> the, 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 the role, the, the job. Um, Lynch uh, also saw Dune as being too broad for a standard 90-minute runtime, uh, but his attempts to split the project into two movies were quashed by producers. Uh, with a budget of over 40 to 42 million, Dune began filming in Mexico with 80 sets built on 16 sound stages and a crew of 1,700 with over 20,000 extras. Um, the, the cast is not quite as like recognisable today as it would have been in 1984. Four, but names and faces that I recognised when I watched it recently include uh, Kyle McLaughlin plays Paul Atreides, so he's the coffee guy from Twin Peaks. Yes. Um, you've also got Patrick Stewart, who plays Gurney Halleck, who's played by Josh Brolin in the new films. I'm oh. Patrick Stewart. There's a very famous scene <laughs> in David Lynch's Dune where Patrick Stewart is carrying a pug in like a baby... Uh, thing you know like the, the yeah, strap, baby, the, the baby, baby carrier beyond. he's carrying a a pug into battle and he's like to battle or whatever and he's just no context has a pug in a, in a baby carrier on his chest <laughs> pugs survive they don't yeah, evolve p- pugs don't evolve <laughs> they get even flatter <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and infamously, also, uh, Sting was cast as Fade Rafa. <laughs> this is Austin Butler from June Two. Um, oh. Yeah, so he's he's very strange um, character design. Oh. He's got like spiky orange hair, and he's topless for a lot of it. It's very I've strange. I've seen photos of him. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I never knew what the movie was. Yeah, it's Can Sting. He looks, like he's, he looks like he's in the Sex Pistols. Yeah. But like in the future. Yeah. Six pistols in the future. Yeah. Probably the one with sex laser beams. <laughs> well, this film also had a, a popular band at the time come on board to score it. Um, do, who do we want to guess? Who who do we reckon scored David Lynch's June? Queen. No. Right yeah, ballpark, that's a good though. guess, though. It's the right ballpark. Flash Gordon, which I think... Oh, yeah, true, mm-hmm, actually. Mm-hmm. I, thought, I thought I was being quite funny, but that wasn't a bad no, idea. Yeah, 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 definitely <laughs> in the right ballpark. Um, think um, think uh, they've got a very famous song that's about a continent. Oh, Toto. Toto, Toto scores <laughs> June 1984. <laughs> So yeah, the, that, that makes sense. <laughs> the first cut of the film, um, and like the the initial edit, ran over four hours, uh, which was eventually whittled down to just over two hours, with the use of voiceover and new scenes shot to compress the story. There are several versions of the film out there with varying durations, but the theatrical cut, which released in cinemas in 1984, was but a conservative 137 minutes. So. It's yeah, a little over two hours. Um, I think the the version that I saw was the worst one. <laughs> whatever that, whatever that, that was. Well, that's uh, maybe all of them actually, Dave. So. Yeah. It was honestly ten or fifteen minutes, and there was a lot of voice of like Kyle McLaughlin was like I don't mm-hmm. know being having being telepathic with someone, and I was like, what is going yeah. on? And then Sting was there, and I was yeah. like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm high myself. <laughs> the melange got you. Your eyes are turning blue. 
<laughs> so I think it's important to understand that David Lynch is one of those artists whose work is often so beyond reproach that any criticism of his work can be rebuked with a classic, you just don't get it. Which I actually, <laughs> that, that's probably true. A lot of his stuff, which hasn't worked for me, has been confusing, not like poorly constructed or anything, right? Uh, but with that being said, even the biggest Lynch fans in the world tend to be very divided on Dune 1984. Um, it is generally considered his worst movie uh, and David Lynch himself has disowned the film uh, denying the offer to edit a director's cut and prefers not to talk about it in interviews wow is June 1984 related to Wonder Woman 1984 uh, they're both bad movies is that um <laughs> <laughs> But actually, I'll, I'll do you one better. They're both bad movies by promising directors that I actually really like. Um, <laughs> so quite related. There, yeah, there you go. There are some defenders of June 1984. It's sort of a cult film now. Um, and I will say, I think it's aged quite well. The, the 1980s digital effects would have looked really cheap and limited at the time and and um, even upwards of like 10, 20 years later. But now I feel like they present like a rich and nostalgic aesthetic. Uh, visually, there's a lot of harsh green screens and dopey stop motion. Um, and it's very silly, but, but what I like about it is it feels far more like otherworldly in my opinion than the than the new films like it feels genuinely alien like you haven't you haven't just gone to a new planet you've gone to a new ecological system you know like yeah I, I, I didn't hate how it looked, but that is to say nothing of the plot and the pacing, <laughs> which is nuts. In my opinion, the film chugs along at a fairly com uh, comfortable rate for the first few acts. Um, characters are underdeveloped and some of the, the, the like big heavyweights are reduced to like two dimensional pastiches for time, but the main stuff is all there and the events that would be later contained to the entirety of 2021's Dune part one um, take up almost the full length of 1984's Dune with the events of 2024's Dune Part 2 reduced to the final 40 minutes um, wow. at which point it just snaps into a breakneck pace with liberal use of voiceover and montage just to get it over and done with the entire second half of the story is squeezed into this last chunk and is edited like a previously on section at the start of a TV show you know <laughs> so it's like and then he did this and then he did this instead of like the slower pace of the first um, three quarters. <laughs> Uh, the film also underperformed at the box office, grossing $30.9 million from a budget of uh, around $40 million. And famous film critic Roger Ebert gave it one star out of four and wrote, The movie is a real mess, an incomprehensible, ugly, unstructured, pointless excursion into the murkier realms of one of the most confusing screenplays of all time. The Whoa. movie's <laughs> plot will no doubt mean more to people who have read Herbert than those those who are walking in cold, he later named it the worst movie of the year. So, Dave, very good company. Roger Ebert, probably the most respected film critic in the world, um, agrees with you. <laughs> I'm actually so relieved to hear that because I thought that I might get a lot of flack from no. not liking it. But <laughs> like thank I God. Said, I mean, if Ebert is always right, right? Yeah, well, he, well not always. He didn't like, I think, The Matrix was a famous one. He poo pooed. Um, but anyway, I've. Um, I well, actually, this will be relevant for phrasing the bar. He rated the Mummy Three the highest of the Mummy trilogy. Isn't that? <laughs> oh my god! Doesn't that offend you? Doesn't that offended me when I uh, found that out? Um, yeah, anyway. they can't rank. They're all equally perfect. <laughs> oh, the third one is where Rachel Weisz isn't in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or they recast. Are they recast? They recast. Her? Recast. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and their son Criminal. is an adult. Yeah. 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 Terrible film. It's bad. Terrible. Um, but not as bad as June 1984. Uh, and while uh, many of the people involved were were able to salvage their careers from it, um, it is also maybe the reason we haven't seen Sting in a lot of things um, since, or a lot of uh, main <laughs> roles since. I think a lot of people consider it like the the career ruining 
uh, or the movie career ruining thing for Sting. Um, and really the only person who was at all happy about the film's failure was one uh, Alejandro Hordorowski, who <laughs> begrudgingly <laughs> saw the film and was delighted to see how bad it turned out, but he was careful to blame the meddling producers and not Lynch's directing. He actually says, in the documentary, he says, I love David Lynch, and I went along, and, and as, as I was watching the movie, I started to feel elated that it was terrible. <laughs> So, <laughs> wow. So, there's um, uh, there's um, always a silver lining for at least one person involved in these uh, terrible movies, either getting made or not getting made. <laughs> AJ, he um, he also gave one out of four stars to David Lynch's Blue Velvet, which is seen as one of his better ones. Right? There you go. Yeah, he mustn't have liked David Lynch. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the like. He's got a few biases you can track through his reviews like that. Um, where he, he won't like one thing or, or, or something like that. So after the absolute chaos of both Hodorowski and Lynch's attempts at adapting Dune, the franchise entered a dark age into the late 80s and 90s, uh, with any expansions on the source material being far more underground. There were several retro video games based on Dune released around this time, um, including one that borrowed imagery from the Lynch film. Uh, these tended to bear, uh, to, to fear bear, better than the movies uh westwood studios dune 2 released in 1992 are uh, being considered you guessed it one of the most influential video games of all time so wow a lot of that has come up a lot in in uh dune's legacy um of note as well were a couple of mid-budget TV shows produced in the early 2000s. A three-episode miniseries called Frank Herbert's Dune was released in 2000 and a sequel miniseries, Frank Herbert's Children of Dune, based on the second and third novels, came out in 2003. Here we see the likes of William Hurt and James McAvoy join the franchise's growing list of associated stars. And the series was actually received fairly positively but criticised for lacking spectacle, which is to be expected from a TV, a, an mm. early 2000s TV budget for something like Dune. Right. Yeah. Uh, luckily, though, with the massive innovations in the digital effects boom of the 2000s with films like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and the new Star Wars movies, the famously unfilmable novel was starting to seem a little more filmable, and eventually the reins of the long-fabled Perfect Dune adaptation were picked up by French-Canadian director Denis Villeneuve, which is, funnily enough, the hardest-to-pronounce name in this whole report. I find <laughs> De Denis Villeneuve. I... I I looked it up. I repeated it back at the YouTube lady saying it back at me, and I'm still not sure that I've got. Wasn't, there was a wasn't there a race car driver called Villeneuve? Villeneuve? Yeah, uh, two Jacques Villeneuve, and he also his father. I think they're the the father son only world champion, something like that. Wow. <laughs> what any a, relation, Najo? Uh, well, I don't know how many Villeneuves are in the in the world. I guess is the is the well, question. At least three. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, his father, Gilles Villeneuve. Oh, wow. There we go. Uh, yeah. So, um, I kind of think of Denis Villeneuve as like a French version of Christopher Nolan. Um, he is hailed by some of his contemporaries as being one of the best currently working filmmakers. And if you haven't seen them, his films are Prisoners, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049 are all fucking great. Probably some of the finest pieces of mainstream cinema of the 2010s, in my in my humble opinion. <laughs> and are they all sci-fi? Um, Prisoners is more of like a crime thriller. He also did Sicario. I haven't seen Sicario, but that's a pretty uh, famous one of his as well. Um, but yeah, Arrival is about like first contact with aliens and Blade Runner 2049, obviously a, a um, sequel to Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. So Villeneuve- oh, I've got to fact check myself. Got to Ooh. fact check myself Ooh. on the F1. I'm so sorry. Oh Gilles God. Villeneuve, the father, only came second in the world championship. Wow. The father's the only son, father I'm thinking son of to come second. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. I was thinking of Graham and Damon Hill. Wow, uh, much oh. easier to pronounce uh, surname. <laughs> Dave, don't ever embarrass this podcast again. Yeah, I'm that, so was, that, was, that was that was for that was for the one person in you. That was I'm sorry. One. I'm really that was embarrassing, mate. That, that was, was a I'm, really bad one. We may never recover from this. Yeah, I don't think so either. For sure, this is you, you now look worse than Sting <laughs> after the release of 1980s. Yeah. Yeah. we've lost the Ecclestein dollars. Is that his name? Sure. 
<laughs> Wait, it's Matt, a race card, guys. Matt, you don't oh, ever no. embarrass this podcast again. <laughs> oh, no. I am sick of carrying you two by just shutting up because I don't know anything. <laughs> Except um, Mulholland Drive, because I wanted yeah. AJ's approval. Yeah, and you got it. You got it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, you, you, there's another one. I forgot there's also Keki and Nico Rosberg that also won the world championship. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to kick Dave off that's, the Zoom call, I think. You've, had, actually, you've done enough damage It's actually here, mate. more common for father-sons to win than non-related <laughs> <Yes>. brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Denny Villeneuve was uh, and is a perfect fit for Dune, uh, beating both Lynch and Hordorowski by having actually read the books and already <laughs> uh, been a fan before seeking out the job. Uh, before he, before it was greenlit, he he was quoted as saying, a long-standing dream of mine is to adapt Dune, but it's a long process to get the rights, and I don't think I will succeed. So, you know, that's pretty cool that he, he got wow. to achieve his lifelong goal when he secured a deal with Warner Bros uh, to adapt the first novel into two films, presumably because studios were now very aware of how long and arduous this novel was. I don't think I've ever heard anyone call it Warner Bros. Hey, we're Warner Bros, dude. Is that what the people <laughs> say? Sorry. I know it's written Warner Bros. I'm sorry, you've never heard someone call it Warner Bros. No, it's the Warner really? Brothers. Really? Uh, yeah. bo- both are acceptable, but I've heard Warner, Warner Bros plenty of times. Hey, hey, Warner Bros. <laughs> and that's funny coming from Australians because we do shorten everything. So you'd think mm. if we were going to call it one or the other, we would go for Bros. Does Bros sound? Does that sound familiar to you? Do Warner you, Bros. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard both. Do you, and you have the bloody theme park over there as well. Don't yeah. You? Oh yeah, Hollywood what? on the Gold Coast. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, so you don't call it. New World. What? Wow, so you do call it. That'll be it. That'll be because you have a cultural touchstone that That's refers right. to yeah. them as brothers. Yeah. Whereas yeah. I, I watched Animaniacs where they call themselves the Warner Bros. Oh no, they do. What do they say in that? We are the Warner. Mm. They say oh, a lot oh, of oh, stuff in Animaniacs, man. <laughs> oh, oh, they say heaps of shit on Animaniacs. Are oh, you just realising you've made a huge I'm, mistake? I'm disconnecting from the from the Zoom call right now. <laughs> Jess? <laughs> Jess, what about him? Me and Dave are off the pod for making a mistake, and now him for this thing that we don't think is a mistake, but still. I couldn't even get a fucking word in, mate. <laughs> I like, yeah, oh, the, Jess, the mistake I'm is like called chance, Warner Bros. Bros. Kick Warner him Bros. Off. He kicked himself off. He said, I'm leaving, I'm disconnecting. And, I, and I, in my head, I was going, yeah, good that instinct. Makes sense. <laughs> makes sense he'd say bros. He's, I wish Dave would do the same. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the biggest film bro I've come across. Mm. Did you see before when he's told Jess she's got to watch The Godfather? Ugh. <laughs> Did I say you that? haven't seen the Godfather. That's great. I, have. I, I love, I love the idea that I subconsciously, without realizing, told someone they have to see the Godfather. What a, <laughs> what a pastiche I've become. <laughs> um, so Villeneuve began writing the screenplay and assembling his cast, uh, which was pretty much every big exciting name in Hollywood, including you've got Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides, Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica, Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto Atreides, Josh Brolin as Gurney Halleck, Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, uh, Dave Bautista as Raban, Zendaya as Chani, Charlotte Rampling as Reverend Mother Moheim, Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho, uh, Javier <laughs> Bardem as Stilgar, and David wow. Desmalchian as Peter DeVries. And uh, joining the cast for the sequel, which released earlier this year, which we didn't really say, but that's part of the reason why I offered to do a Dune report is because it seemed like the iron was hot to to strike yeah. the the Dune um, uh, in, in the cultural moment that, that is right now. Um, yeah, we want to ride that wave. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have Austin Butler as Fade, Ratha Harkonnen, uh, Florence Pugh, second episode in a row that Florence Pugh has been brought up. Uh, she plays Ugh, Princess... Florence Pugh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Florence Pugh plays Princess Arulin, um, Leah Sidhu as Lady Margot Fenring, and Christopher Walken as the Galactic Emperor Shaddam IV, which is pretty interesting casting because this is not Walken's first Dune-related role uh, oh. as he famously 
danced his way through a shopping mall in the music video for the song Weapon of Choice by Fatboy Slim, which contains the lyrics, Walk without rhythm, it won't attract the worm, which is a reference to how the Fremen walk in disjointed steps across the Arrakis Desert in order to not attract Shai Halud, who can sense rhythmic vibrations in the ground. Wow. 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 And he was also in the Presidents of the United States' film clip for a little blue dune buggy. That's not true. (laughs) Oh, great. I'll I'll add that to the report. (laughs) So, yeah. Great tune, though. Yeah, yeah, you familiar with the song, everyone? Uh, It's such a good song. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Little blue dune buggy (laughs) in the sand. Little blue dune buggy (laughs) in my hand. I think Little <laughs> blue dune buggy. Nice. That's going in. I'm not. You're, you're about. You're seconds away from asking me to remove that. I'm Can not you going edit to. that out? <laughs> <laughs> and he won't. Uh, yeah. So um, the legendary composer Hans Zimmer scores both films, which I think is not nothing against Pink Floyd or Toto, but I think it's a it's certainly a more uh, grandiose uh, person to assign uh, the job. Um, and both films, Dune and Dune Part 2, received critical acclaim upon release, but the Dune curse was still alive and well, uh, with the first film releasing towards the the what, what Hollywood will call the tail end of the pandemic. Um, uh, they released it in a baffling cinema slash streaming same day release on HBO Max Um, so would you rather go see this literally made for the big screen movie at home or or in you know do you want to go out to the COVID ravaged uh, streets to go and watch it how it was intended to be seen Um, so everything was underperforming financially around this time Uh, but the the early streaming release put the sequel's fate in question initially Um, And also, despite his skill, Villeneuve had also had a pretty bad track record with flops, especially Blade Runner 2049, which is thought by some to have been omitted from the best picture conversation at the 2018 Academy Awards because of its underwhelming box office. Like, everyone got rave Uh reviews, but it underperformed financially. um, And it did win Best Cinematography for Roger Deakins, who's the Steven Spielberg of cinematography, and that's his first... Um, Oscar win and rightly rightly deserved. I think it's a and have you guys seen Twenty Forty Nine? Beautiful film. I love Twenty Forty Nine. No, but it's funny to be the Steven Spielberg uh, and still also work in the same industry as Steven Spielberg. <laughs> well, no, sorry, sorry. Um, um, I'm talking about Roger Deakins, the cinematographer, the director of photography, not the. No, director. yeah, no. I still find that. Surely he's more funny. like the, the Jacques Villeneuve of cinematography. Yeah, sure. certainly not the Gilles Villeneuve mm. coming second. Mm. Terrible. I I watched. I've watched about half of it the first nice. half and i was going to come back to it but right. so you're the reason it underperformed then is what you're telling me yeah well it's just <laughs> you know it was i'd seem pretty good mm. that's ryan gosling uh uh yeah and yeah. am i right is david batista in it as well he is he's got tiny little glasses and the, these glasses yeah, that and I- they clip off in the middle right i remember that about it i should go back to that that was pretty good i bought bought these glasses Partially inspired by Dave Batista's little glasses and uh, Blade Runner 2049. And they're working. Thanks the so much. The cast for June's really interesting with um, – because quite a few of them are, are uh, maybe most famous for being in big sci-fi blockbusters as well, like Guardians of the Galaxy and mm. Star Wars and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Aquaman. Yeah. Is that a sci-fi blockbuster? Sure. Absolutely. Of course, it's I don't sci-fi. know. The difference between sci-fi and fantasy is tricky. I know mm. fantasy is typically Star Trek is sci-fi and yeah. fantasy Star Wars. Is that right? Well, I would call Star. <laughs> this is so nerdy, and it's even worse that I sincerely went in to say this. I would classify Star Wars as a, as a space opera more than a fantasy. Okay. But the, the people often say like Star Wars is what happens when you take a sci-fi. Well, when you make when you take a fantasy and put it in sci-fi's clothing basically, because right, gotcha. fa- wow. fantasy tends to be about magic, whereas sci-fi tends to be about, like, scientific concepts that are, you know, presented as possible in what we know of science currently, I guess. <laughs> that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. That's um, actually the first thing that's made sense to me this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, luckily, the sequel was greenlit soon after the first film premiered, got rave reviews, and- 
uh, Warner Brothers were like, well, we're going <laughs> to greenlight this. I think they waited too long. I think that they should have greenlit them at the same time so that Dune Part 2 could have come out like 10 months later. I think that they they lost a lot because probably the most common and probably most valid criticism of Dune Part 1 is that structurally it feels like half a story. It's very long. It's two and a half hours long or so, but it does it, it structurally the 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 movie watching self that has been you know you've been watching movies your whole life you get to the end and there is a feeling of like oh it feels like we're just getting started um i really like it but that is a valid uh, complaint of the film um and also i have a dumb brain so i had to watch it a few times to fully understand uh, all the wonderful terminology it was my first introduction to the to the franchise was watching that movie um yeah uh, part two, though, seems to have a much more unanimous acclaim with many film com- commentators, myself included, uh, seeing it as a landmark achievement in filmmaking whose influence, like the source material, will be seen in future films for years to come. This is the dark night of the 2020s. This is the... or um, wow. I don't know. Remember when Mad Max Fury Road came out and it feels like it was the biggest thing ever? Dune Part 2, I think, is going to be the movie that gets imitated the most in probably the next five to ten years, I think, anyway. And wow. Is it, is it a, a box office hit as well? Yeah, it's, it's doing really well, both uh, critically and uh, at the box office. Uh, the only person who doesn't seem to like uh, the new Dune movies is maybe <laughs> Alejandro Odorowski. Um, <laughs> to be fair, I, I couldn't find a quote from him after the movies released, but before they came out, he, you know, was very sort of sourpuss about it and being like, oh. He was waiting for Paul to sprog a whole, like, <laughs> field in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> sprog. <laughs> Uh, he did say he would see it though. So, but no word on wow. what he thought of it. Which that actually means a lot from him. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. I think um, he he said I'll hate watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll wait till it's on a streamer and I'll hate watch it then. Mm, mm. Um, an open world MMO video game titled Dune Awakening is currently in production, which looks to be set in the specifically in the universe of the new films. Uh, and another TV show titled Dune Prophecy is in development at uh, HBO Max. Sorry, Max, it's just called now because dropping your brand name from your product is a, a smart business decision. Uh, <laughs> Dune Prophecy is said to focus on the origins of the Bene Gesserit thousands of years before the events of the films. Uh, uh, and finally, Villeneuve also recently announced that he is, in fact, working on a screenplay for the third film, Dune Messiah. Um, I did look up, like, what's the deal with the other sequels? So Herbert Frank Herbert wrote six films, and I, I found a Reddit thread that says, how filmable is the rest of the Dune series? And pe- most people are saying that Dune Messiah and Children of Dune will work. Um, God Emperor of Dune could maybe be a, a, a TV series, but the other two books, uh, which are called Chapter House Dune and... Um, what was the other one? Chapter House Dune. That's the, that's yeah, the that sixth one. That doesn't sound. <laughs> it's not good. Good. No, it's, it, it's my least favorite title of, of the bunch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's something about it. Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune are apparently <laughs> very unfriendly to uh, adapting. I, I saw a comment that said that, that the books five and six will be harder to adapt because uh, they're very philosophical, a lot of talking, and has, uh, quote, weird sex stuff in them. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, now yeah. I'm listening. <laughs> oh, finally, <laughs> finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then they're saying you can't make it because of the weird sex stuff. <laughs> exactly. Right, get, exactly. Get the holy mountain guy back on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He sounds like this would be right up his alley. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, that is, that's my report on the unfilmable novel that was eventually filmed and split into two films. And finally, given the illustrious cinematic treatment that it so, so deserved for over, over 50, nearly 60 years. The, yeah, wow. the author of the films went, did you say he, he wrote, did he write screenplays for the books as well? Or he, I believe he, he did, never intended he, them to. Oh, sorry, Frank Herbert, do you mean? 
Yeah. So he wrote a script that uh, are based on the first film, and that was going to be the Ridley Scott one that Ridley Scott right. then ditched. And when David Lynch came on, he re- re- he wrote his own, right, own gotcha. version. I didn't include too much and, about that because it, uh, this was already very long, and um, yeah. it seemed like the less interesting unmade how, how film. How long did he survive, uh, Herbert? He died in 1986, so a couple of years after he was able to see his work sullied by David Lynch. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Sting killed him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Good one, Sting. Sting, 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 Sting in, those, in, in those, little, those little underpants just was too much mm-hmm, for him. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> little underpants. It's, it's really he interesting. Got, he had a heart attack in his balls. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there it is. There's a regret face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the um the like the aesthetic for the Harkonnens in the new films is like pale, like painted on white, like body paint, very black and white, dark, very creepy. I I think in the original books, it's kind of a vaguely homophobic. Uh, very camp depiction is what the Harkonnens are oh. in the book. And in the David Lynch movie, it's just they're all ginger. They're all ginger and don't wear a lot of a lot of clothes. So a bit like you, Matt. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, well, do you want to read it now, Dave? That, I guess that's the question at the end of the episode. I, I think I want to see the films. They sound like a much more palatable, like the, the new ones. Mm-hmm. That is. I'll never go back to, this, to, the, <laughs> to the Lynch one. My God. There's not enough lifetimes. Mm-hmm. But the, the novel itself... Now you've said the fact that the main character has 58 different names. <laughs> He's the messiah for 30 different cultures. Yeah. It does. And the fact that the names, apart from Paul and Duncan, seem a bit full on. I yeah, wonder Jessica. how I'll go. Ugh. Yeah, Jessica. Ugh. But- that's a you mouthful. Know what? I'm, yeah, I'm gonna gi- I'm gonna give it a crack and see how I go. Nice. Well, because that I think the only way I'll get anywhere near reading it is by listening to book cheat <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do it so you don't have to. Okay, there I'll sacrifice go. myself. There you go. Because you'll cut off your arms if it means putting out a good episode of <laughs> exactly. And my child is currently training in seven different types of martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with the podcast, but you know, sacrifices must be made. <laughs> <laughs> Far out mm. oh, AJ thank you so much for that What an absolute treat Of course Thank you so much for putting in the terms that we could understand Yeah yeah. yeah. Well, Simpletons like was, us I fully, as Now well. I fully get it <laughs> Yeah <laughs> Zert, Zertog yep. uh, took over the empire of sand Yep uh, He was snorting up <laughs> mushrooms Yep mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah in the end they splooged a new um, meadow Yep. In the desert. Absolutely. So, and, and flew off into space yeah. and saved the universe. So, <laughs> easy. Yeah, I said, my work here is done and they- See, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hordorowski understands that for some of life's hard questions, there are very easy answers, I think, is, is yeah. what he can see <laughs> that none of these other artists could see. There's no mm. easier answer to any question for me than saying, no. <laughs> that's a no. Yeah. Uh, that's a no from me. <laughs> that, that's how Sorry, we talk. I went full Is that how Australian we talk? No. No. <laughs> Uh, AJ, thank you so much for that. I don't. Do you feel like hanging around for everyone's favorite section? Or oh, it's everyone's it, favorite AJ. section. I've got to. <laughs> okay. I, I need to stay around for it because I edit these. I need to stay around for it to, to actually speed you guys through it. I think because <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes yeah, actually, the, smart. sometimes the edit job on some of these episodes is already harrowing, and then I check the <laughs> the duration, and we've only just got to everyone's favorite section. And it's got another yeah. another hour just left to go. Begin. <laughs> Sorry, that's true. Just in case some people are going to ditch this now, I don't think they ever will because this is the favourite section of the show. Mm. Or if people are tuning in now because they've skipped ahead to this section, we, your enthusiasm for movies and, and uh, popular culture is infectious. Thank you so we much. We love hearing you talk about it, AJ. And people can hear you talk about it regularly on your own podcast called Pop Show. Correct. So mm-hmm. I have a podcast. Been good. Get this. We're much less um, well-known than you guys are, but we've been going for about the same amount of time, which I always thought was was kind of fun, that, like, we've, we've, we're entering, like, our eighth year now, I think. So there is a massive backlog of episodes i wouldn't necessarily recommend going back too far um but yeah we do a show called cold popcha <laughs> where um every two weeks we do something called film franchise fortnights where we 
look at a different we watch an entire film franchise and discuss it with me and, and my co-host Richard um, and uh, Matt has actually just been on an episode a crossover episode between uh, Primates and uh, Cold Popshire where we looked at two films called Space Chimps and Space Chimps has that 2, come out? Zartog's Revenge no Zartog Strikes Back no it's not out <laughs> yet I think um I think at Richard's the time still of editing. this episode coming out, though, I mean, yeah, no? uh, yeah, it comes out on Monday, so, so yeah, yeah, so I'll put I'll put it out in the primates feed, so you can find it primates and cult pop char. Yes, please. Um, I also, if anyone's interested, I haven't, I don't usually plug this as much, but I'm also like a an an amateur filmmaker with a filmmaking crew called One Dollar Genre that where I've been asked by my producers to to use all every connection I have to try and get uh, One Dollar Genre more uh, more seen. So we make a short film every month that is uh, based on a genre that gets chosen by the Patreon we set up for it. So that's also something I do if anyone wants to see wants to see me. Put, I actually didn't put my money where my mouth is and actually make a film instead of just talk about it. I love that. Mm. I didn't know you, about that. I'm going to check it out. It's awesome. You must be the busiest man in New Zealand Hollywood. <laughs> I, I truly, oh, it's certainly in Christchurch. <laughs> That's you and Peter Jackson, right? Totally, yeah. <laughs> the big two. Peter Jackson's too busy rigging mayoral elections, uh, which is a story for another time when I come and do my uh, slanderous Peter Jackson report for you guys. <laughs> wow. <laughs> love it. What is uh, New Zealand Hollywood called? Uh, Auckland. Just the New Zealand film industry. <laughs> well, wa- I mean, if you go to Wellington, they do have what I consider to be a pretty, like, gross, ugly Wellywood sign on the hill when you fly in. <laughs> I think it's pretty stupid. Uh, Wellywood. But, yeah. <laughs> I disagree. I think that rules. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's weird that the Windy City's got something that's so derivative like that. Um, so, the way this... <laughs> the way this... I don't um, get it, but they laughed. With Chicago's Windy City. Yeah, right. Wellington also calls itself the Windy, Windy City. City. So I was saying it's, yeah, it's nah, funny that they it. do some derivative, yeah. and, but I called them. That is good stuff. Can you beat <laughs> Chicago on a good day, though? That's the question, because you famously can't beat Wellington on a good day. Oh, wow. Yeah. I love Wellington. Is so good. I uh, love visiting Wellington. Nice. Beautiful city. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of a city I don't live in, thank you. <laughs> Christchurch, another beautiful city. <laughs> beautiful place. Yeah. Uh, everyone, New Zealand's just a beautiful country. Yeah, thank you. I everyone think. should go. No, don't don't come here. We're already uh, dealing with the fallout of the. Oh the, um, wait, American hang on. Is that politics is taken over here now as well? Everyone should go to New Zealand. <laughs> Jeez, Everybody, that, book your tickets. That that had a little ring of "fuck off, we're full" about it, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying it's our thing. The, the, the "fuck off, we're full" is the um, American sentiment that seems that t- seems to have. Um, come yeah. over this way but you're right maybe i need to ke- carefully examine how i'm um <laughs> expressing that concern so anyway aj this next part of the show is everyone's favorite section where we uh thank some of our fantastic supporters if you want to get involved go to patreon.com slash do go on pod mm-hmm. have you ever been a patron aj i actually am currently a patron you are um, a freaking legend. so i give you some um. of the money back that you give me to <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, though, because because we have people like on our team as well that pay for our Patreon for the various benefits, but it's like Patreon doesn't give you an option to to give people like a, a comp. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Why would they? Because they get a cut from people just yeah. passing their uh, support around their friends. Mm, exactly. Dogs. Nah, good on them. The good people good there. On them. We love them and we rely on them, but uh, Patreon, you know, it's a perfect system. Patreon.com slash pod is where you can support us. Uh, and if you want to do that, there's a bunch of different rewards. I think Jess is probably in the best place to explain some of these. Uh, the seat to the left yes. of you. Well, yes, it yes. is the best place for <laughs> So, the benefits. Yes. Uh, voting on topics. Yes. Um, two out of three you're voting on. Uh, there's also early access to uh, live shows, to tickets, to live streams we do yeah, sometimes. Discounts, discounts. For the tickets as well. Um, there you get access to the Facebook group, which is the nicest corner of the internet. Yes, where I've I've started semi regularly when I'm in different places. I said I've been doing some Patreon catch ups, which yeah, have been really fun. We've got nice. one coming up in Melbourne uh, tonight at the time of recording. It's already happened, and it was a great time. Beautiful time. It was. <laughs> no one else showed up, but it was. I just think it was nice for me to hang out. Yeah. You know. You, you know. 
It's nice for you yeah, to hang out. Yeah, it was out. nice for me it's to hang nice out. It's nice for you to get a price. Yes. yes. Um, and we also do three <laughs> bonus episodes a month, just moving on from Matt being sad and alone. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, let's much. thank some of our wonderful people. I would have been – I'm interstate, Matt, otherwise I would have been there, I swear to you. I would have been there. And, and Jess? I am busy. <laughs> yeah. You're supporting your friends. <laughs> I'm supporting my friends at my home. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Good on you. I'm my own friend. <laughs> but somehow we came all the way around for you to sound as sad as me. Yeah. So, anyway, the first thing we do <laughs> is called the Fact, Quote, or Question section. This is for people who have signed up on the Sydney Scheinberg Deluxe Memorial level. And uh, this section actually has a little jingle go something like this. Fact, Quote, or Question. Ding. It was too high pitched ah, for the. He always remembers the ding. Too, I mean, too high pitched for the, it, the Zoom audio gate. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You couldn't hear that? I was. <laughs> I'm sure it Honestly, because nice. you paused for so long, I thought, oh my God, have I done it yeah. wrong? What's happening? <laughs> 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 yeah, it was, uh, was uncomfortable because we could see you ding, but we couldn't yeah. hear you ding. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so I meant silently ding and then pause and look sad. <laughs> uh, so the way this works is people can give us a fact, quote, or question, or a brag or a suggestion if they're on the Sydney Schoenberg level. I'll read them out then for the first time. That's uh, just excusing myself for mucking up pronunciations or them saying something crook. But the first one <laughs> this week is from Amelia Todd, and they also get to give themselves a title. Amelia's title is still the official website quality assurance tester. Nice. Bloody hell, Amelia, you're doing. God's work there. And Amelia has a question writing, Hi, guys. On a recent episode, one of your patrons, Tessa, wrote in saying she's having a baby due in August. I'm also having a baby due in August. Wow. Uh, if Tessa is listening, I wanted to wish her loads, of, uh, lots of good vibes for the remainder of her pregnancy and beyond. Ah, that's pretty appropriate. That's like a sci-fi sort of thing to say, isn't it? It's, it's exactly um, like a sci-fi thing. You're, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, we're about halfway there already. Also, since it came up in the last conversation, I'm a Virgo. Oh, another Virgo, virgin, uh, virgin birth. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like, like Jesus. Anyway, I sort of like Space Paul. Um, yeah, yeah. Now on to my question. <laughs> I'd love to hear any tips and advice you guys have for a soon-to-be new parent like myself. It's possible Dave's might be the most relevant since he welcomed in a little one of his own recently. Congratulations, Dave. But I'd love to hear from Jess and Matt as well or whoever else is there oh, if it's a guest episode. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Uh, P.S. I listen to all the ads. Thank you for listening to all the ads. Dave, I'm <laughs> going to ask you to sit this one out. Um, I, think yeah, the, I think between AJ, Matt and I, <laughs> we have got some good parenting yeah, tips. I, I think maybe better than anyone, AJ currently lives next to her. Kindergarten. Yeah, that's true. Not for long, though. Right? I'm moving out in, in uh, about a week into an apartment. And that's definitely not because of the sound of children. <laughs> um, uh, but parenting tips. What, what do we got? What do we got? What, what are your earliest memories of your parents? What are the things that you remember? You still remember the things that you're so grateful they did for you when you were young? One time when I was a kid, it was raining outside um, and I had sort of just connected that- um, people called rain showers. So I asked if I could shower outside and they said, yeah, go for it. So I ran out into the backyard nude uh, while my parents just kind of <laughs> watched and then my brother threw a bar of soap at me. So I think that would be and you, that would you be a You cracked trick. him around the head with your jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Jess-jitsu. Jess-jitsu. Jujitsu. Jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my advice, I guess. Wait, what is that exactly? If you're going to put that into advice, let them run around nude. Let them learn. Let them learn. learn. Live and learn. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Let your little freak (laughs) run around. I wrote my mum. I just remember just doing all these lovely little things, and she she has told me since because she went back to work when I was I don't know nine or seven or Mm. something, and she's like, oh, I can't. She sort of feels bad. I'm like, no, you don't don't have to feel bad because I remember it. I don't remember any of those times anyway. The main things I remember are the things she did do, like yeah. making Play-Doh for us, you know, homemade Play-Doh, making this book that uh, I can't even remember what it was rewarding, but it was like different pictures and we get to colour it. Like there was one that was heaps of scoops of ice cream on a cone. Yep. And every certain thing that I did, I don't know, read a book or something, we'd get to shade it in a different colour oh, and put a little star sticker on wow. and stuff. That's pretty fun. I remember, yeah, I just remember sweet stuff like that. So I, I think you could probably get more hung up on- what the things you do wrong, but just just enjoy the good times yeah. probably, and um, don't be too hard on your kid because 
Well, whatever. I don't fucking know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my advice... I fucking know. My advice would be... I don't fucking know. Why are you asking me? <laughs> my advice would be um, that you should always put your kid first unless you feel you have a divine calling to direct a movie yeah. based yes. on yeah. this <laughs> unadaptable novel, in which case sacrifice anything, including your child, to get that mm. made. Your arms or your child's mm. yeah. arms. Yeah. Or torso. Yeah. And with everyone having given advice, I think we can move on. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. I oh, know we should say, Dave, any, anything coming to mind there, Dave, as an expert? Ooh, as an expert, yeah. As someone who's been a father for about 50 days at the time of recording. As a father. Uh, as a father. As a father. I would just say- Have you ever had moment- that father? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have. I have. Funny I have. thing. <laughs> I would say at the moment I'm just taking it one day at a time and that is good for, for the fun moments, for the harder moments, maybe in the middle of the night, but it's uh, it's all good. And when we first found out we were pregnant, you know, you go to the hospital and I say we, my wife was pregnant. We went to the hospital and they give you like a a pamphlet and stuff and one of the things was like you got you should come up with a, a mantra. A mantra for for when you for while you're pregnant and when you have the baby, you make you keep coming back something positive. And the mantra we came up with was uh, uh, "bigger fuckheads than us have had babies." Yes, so, <laughs> absolutely true. So and so they've had we heaps like, of them. Exactly. So how hard can it be? Yeah. You'll be okay. Just trust yourself. Take it one day at a time and try and enjoy it. Is what pretty I'm pretty full of way to talk about your parents, <laughs> Dave. But, yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> one of my friends went. Cavemen did this. You know, <laughs> yeah, I can't right. be fucking it up that badly. <laughs> exactly. That's great. Exactly. Yeah, and, so, yeah. And you've got a blog. you got blogs you can read. Yeah. They didn't have blogs. <laughs> you've got all these things you can read to feel like you're doing a bad job. Yeah, that's when, right. When, you know, it's good to have <laughs> things to compare to on blogs. <laughs> Mummy bloggers and whatnot. They're the best people. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, Dave's been telling us that uh, he hardly goes a conversation without someone going, ooh. Hope you don't uh, don't need a good night's sleep for the next twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, look forward to that as well. Yeah, yeah. That's why. Also, I don't want to give advice because you know, one, I've got no idea what I'm doing, and then also you have so many people that will give you unsolicited advice. So I do it's- like the idea. It's like with most things where people universalize their experience. They go, so uh, it was hard for me in this way, so it will be for everyone yes. else. Yeah, that's what I worry about too. I don't want to come across as being like, this is this is exactly what happened to me mm. and it'll happen to mm. you. But this is quite literally solicited advice, Dave. Yes. So, I think you're okay here. But what I will say is a huge congratulations. How exciting. How exciting. August yeah. babies. Um, yeah, it's going to be the best. Good luck and Godspeed. Uh, the next one comes from Nick Fidian. And Nick Fidian is... Uh, also known as the Luckiest Man Alive Version 2. Wow. The long-awaited update edition. Oh, my <laughs> God. Nick Fidian. Uh, and Nick Fidian's got a fact writing, best wedding ever. Oh. As requested about five months ago, we have an update about my wife, Lucy, <laughs> and I, who got married on the 28th of October last year. Unfortunately, Matt, neither of us have an Auntie Faye to have a few too many <laughs> shandies or a rat bag of an Uncle Bill. I remember saying these things. This is the best kind of fact quote or question where it, like, earnestly and sincerely and lovingly references a conversation from two months ago that you've forgotten. (laughs) Mate, I've forgotten what we talked about three (laughs) seconds ago, so. Well, that was mainly because it was AJ spouting nonsense. (laughs) That's true. Because that's Hatterack. Uh, 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 Nick goes on. However, Lucy does have a brother who didn't re- uh, realise driving licences go out of date or that he would need one to drive Lucy's car on the day of the wedding. Uh, that's very good. Luckily, we have other family members who can legally drive and are willing to pick up wedding buffets. Man, Lucy's brother is so clever. Oh, I'd love oh, to go collect the buffet. But, but oh, my, oh. my license is expired. That's can I have crazy. a look? Can I have a look at that? No, 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 no. no, no it's no, definitely it's expired. It's expired. I could do it if you want to risk, you know, me going to jail. <laughs> yeah, but you would have to wear the fine. Yeah. So okay. I've already had to rent a new suit. Yeah. <laughs> rent a new suit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nick goes on. 
Luckily for us, but unfortunately for you, nothing went drastically wrong on the day. Though we do know Plato was dropped on the vicar from a balcony. What, what are the odds of Plato coming up twice in five minutes? Yeah. Uh, we had a 26 year old bubble boy in place of a flower girl. Love it. <laughs> it's the mopes. Um, that's a little Seinfeld bub- bubble boy reference. Um, <laughs> and the officiant forgot how to say Lucy's surname after knowing her for roughly 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> That happens to me sometimes. I'm seeing a show and you're like, oh, my God, yeah. I am blanking. Uh, all in all, it was a wonderful day. It was especially nice at the end of the day noticing we'd got a message from Dave via Patreon wishing us many, many congratulations. Listening to your podcast oh, together. Oh, yes. And- That's right. So, I, I somehow remembered on the day of their wedding. That's it come right. up and I thought, yes. oh, it's their wedding today. So, I messaged them on the day of their wedding. They said they read it as they were falling asleep that night. So, oh, very, very So, happy. you know what they'd just been up to. Yeah. Yeah. Smoking a cigarette. Losing yeah, their Virgo married. status. <laughs> um, uh, listening to your podcast together and getting RSVPs via fact quote or question has been a joy for both of us. Apologies for the delay in, on sending this in and sorry it's so long, but Jess did say last time that I could have gushed more. <laughs> also, because I haven't gushed yet, let me do that now. Lucy looks so beautiful on the day and I think I did post a photo on the, in the Facebook group a while back. And my love for her has only continued to grow since then. The first five months of marriage have been truly wonderful. Well, honeymoon period. And I'm looking forward to so, so many more. It's all downhill from here, lad. <laughs> Lucy makes me so happy every day. And it's always the highlight of my day when I get home from work to spend time with her. I truly am so lucky to be with her. Sorry again for the long slash late message, and thank you for indulging me, slash us. Nick, you big old sweetie. Gosh. Thank you for the update. Thank you for gushing. Congratulations again to you and to Lucy. Uh, we've got a gusher, is what you might say. <laughs> um, I wouldn't, but is that from anything? Is that it? Uh, it is now. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, all right, next one comes from Adam Kropinski and or Trapchinski. Oh my god, so it sorry. It was definitely and- the first one, I think. <laughs> the okay. <first> two. <laughs> <laughs> Adam's <laughs> title is official mover and shaker. Wow. And he's got a fact writing. Since we've been having problems with the stove being way too hot, I was able to obtain <laughs> a new stove. Oh. Unfortunately, it makes everything way too cold. Oh. So on another <laughs> note. <laughs> <laughs> I got the so basically I, I got the trip ditch club a new freezer. Great, and I mean oh. like thank you, Adam, but like like oh, the you've, problem is everything is too hot. You've just taken one problem and turned it into a different kind of problem, Adam. Oh. Jesus. Thank you. Like nice thought, but fuck Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it, even if my tone says otherwise. <laughs> and finally, from Nathan L, aka Senior Executive of Delegating Jess's Do Go On Work to Dave. That's correct. I do the least here, and as it should be. And Nathan <laughs> has a fact as well. <laughs> Writing. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. <laughs> 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 hey guys, I have listened to your entire catalogue of episodes and I'm currently on my second run through and for some episodes, my third or fourth time. Wow. Before you think I'm too crazy, I work in parcel delivery, so 40 hours of my week are on the road with an earbud in which allows me to binge several episodes in a row. Nice. Your show has become something of a comfort listen to me. Anyways, I noticed that a previous fact quarter question prompt made a small mistake to you, but quite a large error to me. When talking about American President Andrew Jackson and the relocation of Native Americans, a typo was made that then made all of you ask the wrong questions to the prompt. Oh. Andrew Jackson was behind- the trail of uh, of tears, not the trial of tears. <laughs> the trail of tears was the forced displacement of five civilized tribes of indigenous peoples by the US government and is quite the dark time in American and native history, which is why you may hear many Americans with native ancestors talk extremely unfavorably of President Jackson. Mm. There are many Native Americans who now live west of the Mississippi River while their ancestors were originally from what is now the southeastern U.S., myself included. This was part of the Indian Removal Act and hopefully the of tears part of the name for the trail uh, uh, route 
they force natives on gives you a picture of how that went down without getting too far into it here. Anyways, this was just an update for you all and listeners who may not know too much about the US and Native American relationship during the early years of the country and were confused about a trial in, uh, instead of a trail. Mm. I'm pretty sure this update also fits the criteria of a grim fact. And uh, as the expert on grim facts, I can say, yes, you are <laughs> correct. That is <laughs> a very grim, grim fact. <laughs> Uh, So, Dave, as my title suggests, could you please ask Jess if you may ask Matt if this is a grim fact and then return to Jess with Matt's answer? (laughs) Okay, I'll I'll withhold judgment, actually. I'm going to have a think about it. Uh, Don't worry, Jess. I'll make sure Dave stops slacking and gets back to your work from here on out. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. I'm on it. I'm on it. Um, Oh, they've just done it. And, yeah, Jess, can you tell Dave? Is that right? No, that, Dave has to tell me. Oh, Dave. I sit here and do nothing. Dave, can you tell Jess that, yeah, that is a grim fact? Can I do anything uh, to Jess? help here? Oh, yeah. Actually, AJ, can you pass this on to Jess? Because actually she said something to me that was mean off air mm-hmm. before and I'm not talking mm-hmm. to her. Can you please tell Jess <laughs> that this is a grim fact and also fuck you? Jess, uh, well. Dave says it is a grim fact. And also, what are you doing for lunch later? Do you want to hang out? <laughs> no. no. I, AJ, so I think that. the Zoom stop call that. is, the, the internet's cutting out. <laughs> This is one of those games of telephone where the messages got wildly mixed up. First, first you couldn't hear me ding, and then you couldn't hear me fuck you. <laughs> Interesting. You couldn't hear me fuck you. Uh, the next thing we like to do is shout out to a few of our other great, uh, great supporters. Uh, Thank just you for moving on to the game. And I think Jess really, we got a great opportunity to make AJ do my work, the work here. Yes. Um, so what's the thing? He could give him a. He could give him like a Dune name or something. He's got an idea. I've got, I've I've got the. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the Wikipedia page open for glossary of Dune. I thought we could take the first letter of their first name and I'll find a corresponding piece of Dune jargon for them. Love it. Mm. Dune jargon. Dune jargon. Yes, love that. All right. Well, if I can kick us off, I'd love to thank from the Windy City, but not the the northern hemisphere's windy city, <laughs> Chicago, in Illinois, uh, United States. Mike Joyce, thank you so much. Mike Joyce. So on M, we've got the maker hooks, which are the hooks used for capturing, mounting, and steering the sandworms of Arrakis. So the wow. the freemen actually ride Shai Halud. They worship and ride Shai Halud across the desert. It's how they they migrate. Ah. Cool. Uh, Mike Joyce, what a beautiful tribute that is. You're <laughs> the hook. <laughs> uh, next up from, ooh, address unknown, can only assume from deep within the fortress of the moles, please. Ooh. And thank you to Dave Hancock. Dave Hancock, we've got uh, D wolves, like the letter D and then wolves, which are the guardians of the Serer on Arrakis in the time of Leto II Atreides, ferocious wolves descending from gaze hounds and originally wolves noted for their keen eyesight. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. But AJ, you can say dick on the show. Thank you. They're dick wolves. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and finally, for, for me, from Carrollton in Texas, uh, it's Monday Carey. Monday. Monday. So, M, we're going to? Yep. yep. M or C, whatever you prefer. Um, let's go Missionaria Protectiva, which is an arm of the Bene Gesserit charged with spreading contrived myths, prophecies, and superstition on primitive worlds so that the Bene Gesserit may later exploit those regions. Oh, wow. That's now that a grim, makes you think. That is mm. grim stuff. Mm. May I thank some people? Yes, please. I would love to thank from Sacramento. Oh, my God. California. Capital City. Go Kings, if this still exists as a basketball yes. team. Thumbs up. I would love to thank Trent Kasparis. Trent Kasparis, I'm going to give you thinking machines, uh, which are okay. intelligent and sentient machines created in the likeness of a human mind and thus abolished in the Balterian Jihad, uh, which I think <laughs> this June heads will get mad at me if I get this wrong, but I think that refers to when all computers, all computer technology was wiped out in the timeline of June. Uh, AJ, uh, can, is that? Could you pinpoint the moment when Herbert stopped trying? Was it around the time he came up with thinking machines? <laughs> Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
sinking machines. Um, next, I would like to thank from Appleby in uh, Great Britain, Henry Smith. I've been to Appleby, beautiful village, beautiful have you? town. Yeah. When have you been to Appleby? Uh, a few years ago, I hired a car. I had a friend who was his family was from there. Nice. Went out, and checked out the village green. There was a little market on. It was beautiful. Check out the Irish pub. Gorgeous. <laughs> uh, yeah, might have. <laughs> so, so Henry for Henry, I've got. Um, the Holtzman effect, which is the scientific phenomenon that makes, among other things, instantaneous space travel and defensive force shields possible. Whoa. Mm. Pretty cool stuff, That's actually Henry. pretty huge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and finally for me, I would love to thank, uh, from Helston, also in Great Britain, Sophie Law. Sophie, we've got a lot of options for S. <laughs> uh, let's go. Let's go. Still suit, which is the body and clothing garment of Fremen, uh, which the the design uh, performs the functions of heat dissipation and filtering bodily wastes, as well as retaining and reclaiming moisture. So in Dune, when they're in the desert, they wear these tight black suits that are designed to when you sweat, when you piss, when you any water. <laughs> leaves your body, it recycles it back into your system so that you stay hydrated in the desert. So you're drinking your own piss, essentially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big piss drinkers. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no um, wonder they're focusing on the bloody spice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not the big selling point. What are you going to wash that spice down with? Oh, don't, don't worry don't about, worry it. about don't it. it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, Dave, do you want to thank some people as well? I would love to thank from Frankston South in Victoria. It's Beck Dunn, which is so close to Beck Dune. Wow. Just a double yeah. Also close to ben, Beck Duncan. And, and oh. also <laughs> cl- kind of close <laughs> to Bene Gesserit, but I, we've already just talked about that one, so I'll look for another one. Let's go. Uh, Buddhislam, which is the term for the religions derived from the syncretic fusion of denominations of Buddhism and Islam. So in Dune, wow. relig- they just combined all the religions, basically, to save time, I think. Sure. Oh, okay. Why haven't we thought of that? <laughs> well, that happens over the next 10,000 years, right? Yeah, 10,000 years. It takes time. It takes time. Mm. That's how long oh. I think the genie was in the lamp in Aladdin, isn't 10, it? 10,000 years! Gives yeah. you a mighty crick in the yeah, neck. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> I would also like to thank from Chicago, Illinois, again from the Windy City, a big shout out to Felipe Cabrera. Is that Felipe Ooh. with a P or an F? I was with an F. F. Oh, that's lucky. Nearly went straight to P. I would have looked like an idiot. Um, (laughs) That's that's what June people do when they're looking for a drink. (laughs) Straight to P. Let's let's go. Let's go. Fish speakers, uh, which is an all-female military force created by Leto Atreides to enforce his rule over the known universe. Hell yeah. Fish speakers. Fish speakers. (laughs) <laughs> Shit, yeah, right Fish on. Speakers. Fish speakers. right on. Again, yeah, this is past this is past phoning it in. <laughs> Fish speakers. <laughs> How did he do it? He came up with his own it's law. The most, see, see it stuff. sounds it sounds like he's not trying, but what you gotta understand is June was so influential that people just didn't talk about fish before <laughs> June came along. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And finally, from me, I'd like to thank from Bakery Hill, also in Victoria. Thank you to Kath Martin. Kath with a C. Man, how good is Bakery Hill? Sam? Kath with a C. Sorry, yes, Kath with a Kath C. Kath with All a right. C. Let's go for um, Chome or Combine Honnet <laughs> Ober Advancer Mer. Mer- Kentiles, the Universal Development Corporation controlled by the Emperor and Great Houses with the Guild and Bene Gesserit as silent partners. This corporation essentially controls the economy of the known universe with shares and directorships determining each house's income and financial leverage. Very <laughs> fun. <laughs> Good stuff. That sounds like that might have been more influential on the prequels of Star Wars. Mm, yeah, sort of absolutely. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you so much to Kath, Philippe, Beck, Sophie, Henry, Trent, Monday, Dave, and Mark. And the last thing we need to do is welcome a few people into the Triptych Club. We've got five inductees this week. Uh, Jess, do you want to explain what the Triptych Club is? Triptych Club is like a cool club for cool people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and once. Once you've supported the show for three consecutive years on the shout-out level or above, um, you are welcomed graciously into the club. Uh, We've got everything you could ever possibly need. 
You want to have a nap? Go for it. You want to ride a unicorn? You got it. You want <laughs> soup that's far too hot? <laughs> have I got you covered? Um, yes. Uh, Matt's behind. Matt is lifting up the velvet rope. That's right. I got the door list here. I got five names on it this week. Dave's behind the uh, booking desk, booking your <laughs> <a> band. <laughs> And Dave, who have you booked this this week? You, you are never ever gonna believe it because Mate, before I never this, do. I never do. Before this episode, I actually had no idea what this even meant. Of course, but this is amazing that I've booked this band, a metal band that I haven't thought of in a long time until I booked them for this show. Shy Hulud oh is here today. Oh my god! Whoa! Can you Huge. believe? And they will be performing on Giant Worms. Yes! <laughs> wow! <gasps> Awesome. But, if, but, but when I say giant worms, them. yeah, but no, I mean giant worms, but like in our reality, you know, um, earthworms. So they're oh, like performing on top right, of earthworms. Yeah. Big earthworms. But yeah, like, but quite, some of the biggest ones you've ever seen in your yeah. garden. So now I've got to also come up with some catering for worms. Thanks for the heads up, Dave. <laughs> sorry, but sorry, sorry. Fucking hell. What are, what are they going to have on their soup. rider? <laughs> they love soup. They love it hot too. <laughs> Perfect. Some like it hot. <laughs> and, and when the phrase some like it hot was referring to worms. I'm actually so lost. <laughs> I've like- lost the thread of the joke of why worms eat soup. <laughs> I'm, try- I'm trying yeah. to yes and you guys, but I'm like, yeah, and the, the worms, they eat soup. That's right. Uh- <laughs> they eat soup. Yeah. AJ, mm. you add it, but do you listen to the show? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Jess. Mm hmm. You've got a. You've worked on something behind the bar. You got a drink this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I filled martini glasses with sand. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> drink up, <laughs> yummy. And uh, yeah, you know everyone provides their own June style drinks this week. Just yeah, exactly. Piss into your mouth. Yeah. Bring out the bubbler. <laughs> you can have one complimentary glass of water, and then that should do you. Yeah, that just keeps sucking around. <laughs> All right, so five names here. What? What do we give? What's AJ's role here? Because Dave is on the stage. He's him saying the show. I'm gonna. Uh, welcome in the the new guest, the new inductees into the Triptych Club. AJ can do my job and just hype Dave up. Right. Just go like, yay! Dave to hypes Dave. them up with some sort of weak wordplay or whatever, mm-hmm. based on their name or where they're from. And then, yeah, AJ, you can just try and make Dave feel okay about it because he he'll run out of steam otherwise. My brain is going for uh, for dune theme ways to encu- encourage someone. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> just, just cheer him on. All right. <laughs> So, first up, <laughs> please welcome from Bishampton in maybe Worcestershire in Great Britain, it's Alex Patter. Alex, let me give you a patter on the yes. back as you run on through. <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> there it is. That was June related. <laughs> uh, from London in Great Britain, I'd love to welcome in Jamie Alcantara. Uh, Jamie, you are my no, you ain't you ain't lamey. Oh. You ain't lamey, man. Oh! The man cannot be stopped. <laughs> From Hull, uh, which AJ is, I'm not saying Hill in a Kiwi uh, accent. From Hull for the in Great Britain, it's Nathan Bauer. I bow it down to you, sir. I bow it down oh to you. Oh, my God. I am stunned. I have lost for words <laughs> at how good that word yep. was. From <laughs> Reservoir. <laughs> I got stuck in my head. I'm like, we don't say it how it's meant I know, to be said. No, it's reservoir when it's the suburb. And then uh, I, but I said it. I do it all the time. I didn't say it the right way in either senses. I think you did. And from reservoir in here in Melbourne, it's Lockie. Lockie, here, have a chucky. Pass oh, yeah. limp ball. oh, have a chucky. Oh. <laughs> and finally, from Inchicore in Dublin, in yeah. Ireland, it is. We are. Looking at how <laughs> no, I'm I'm Don't talk about Interesting, related, and often unclear indeed Irish names as well. So make sure to stay tuned and consider subscribing for more learning. Yes! The spelling is confusing, Woo! as is often the case with Irish names, but it's pretty straightforward. Avine. Avine. I'm not joking. That's the same guy that taught me how to pronounce Dinny Villeneuve. So... He's the best. I love this man hey, so much. Matt, welcome, your impression is very good, so it's Avine. Avine. And finally, for me, I'd love to uh, welcome in from <laughs> Ingecore in Dublin, Ireland. It's Avine Hobson. 
A-Vein, just hook them up to my veins, oh. like IV. Sounds a bit like yes. IV drip. Yes. An A-Vein drip, yes. Listen, I'll go Dave, Dave, you are the Quizette's Hederic. You're here to deliver us from, de- deliver us to paradise. That's how good your wordplay is. <laughs> That's right. That's funny that you went for IV, because the name sounds more like vein, like... There's more of a close thing to I vein. I thought you were going right. for anyway. vein okay. as well, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, well, let's just say hook him up to my veins. So, you know, we were all there. <laughs> we were hanging out. We are having a good time. <laughs> well, welcome into the clubs. Make yourselves at home. Get some soup. Beat those worms in for the soup. <laughs> Avina, Lockie, Nathan, Jamie, and Alex Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything we need to tell people just before we... P.O.? Um, just that we love them so much and uh, anybody can suggest a topic. You don't have to be a Patreon to do so. So if you would like to, if there's a story you want to, um, you think would make a good do-go-on report, chuck it in the hat. The hat, um, there's a link to it in the show notes. It's also on our website, which is Do Go On Pod, and you can find us on social media at Do Go On Pod as well. And we're also um, uh, doing comedy festival shows if you're in Melbourne um, come along to those. They're on Sunday afternoons over the next couple of weeks. I don't know what day it is, but come along. It'll be fun. 14th is one with Meso, Nick Mason. The 7th is sold out. There's an extra show on the 14th. And maybe there's a couple of tickets left for the 21st. Nice. I think there's eight left at the time of recording, so who knows well, if they'll still be wow. there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we're big time, AJ. I'm so impressed. Eight we're tickets. in an eight seater. <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy. AJ, thank you again for coming and doing oh, thank the you. pod. Um, have fun editing mm-hmm, this as well. Mm-hmm. And um, if you could also do some of my other tasks, <laughs> like, I don't know, update some social media or something, that would mm-hmm, be great. I will, yeah. I'll take your, your dog for a walk or something. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> All right, Dave, boot this baby home. Hey, thank you so much for listening. Until next time, we'll say thank you so much and goodbye. Later. Bye. Bye. Bye.